Now, Luke, you love the the new Star Treks, right? Uh, I mean, it's the same. It's the same thing as with Star Wars, right? Like you can see, like if you want to know what Rise of Skywalker was going to be, just watch Into Darkness, and it's like, okay, this is exactly it, this 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 mess of things that have just been sort of thrown together haphazardly. Is, is that for Harry Potter? Yep, that's Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful wonder fucking fool oh my god uh hey everybody welcome to another episode of i don't give a flick i am your host johnny blackburn alongside me this week are my co-hosts gary elmore and neil riley and we are very pleased to have with us this week uh our uh, welcoming back for a uh, second time we've got uh lucas Hare. luke welcome back to the show hey guys how's it going and uh, we've got uh, first uh, popping his cherry. We've got uh, the Virgin podcaster. Uh, well, I don't know if you've been on other podcasts, Spencer, um, but we got Spencer Walters with us today. So, Spencer, thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely, guys. What's up? Yeah, and then unfortunately, you guys know my thing. I've got to harp and make fu- harp on mm-hmm. and make fun of uh, good old Jacob Johnson somehow. Thanks, bud. Gary invited him back, and yeah. against my. Better judgment. I know. I, I allowed it. And I, said, I right. actually do like Jacob. I think he does a good job. Do you? Yeah. Thanks, yeah. anyway, nice, Gary. That's yeah. a mistake. No problem. I don't, I, you don't need to. You Gary, need why to are you friends that. with Johnny? Mm. Why are you friends with me, Jacob? What? <laughs> or is that, I, that's a strong word. I'm, that's yeah. a very good I, point. I, we're not really. Okay. Friend of me. You forced yourself on me. I didn't ask for this. Hey. I hey, didn't want this. We got too drunk at the company Christmas party. There's nothing. Did you see what you were true. wearing? I yeah, mean, yeah, you needed you, it. It was very revealing. God. I, I, couldn't keep, I couldn't keep my hands to myself. What can I say? Anyways, that's a topic for uh, another Cancel. another legal case. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and uh, Jacob uh, is the host of the uh, very popular podcast, Jacob and Reese versus Evil. Uh, I did get that right. It is now. Yeah, we've, yeah, yeah. We've confirmed it right. that it is Jacob and Reese versus Evil. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. I know we were a little off on that. Um, anyways, this is uh, the beginning of season two for us. Um, for those of you that are listening that joined us uh, for all of season one, uh, we primarily really stuck to uh, genres of films and stuff that happened behind the scenes. This season, we're looking at taking more of a harder look at uh, franchises and uh, movies in particular and breaking them down. Tonight, we've got a humdinger for you guys. We're going to try to get through the entire Star Wars cinematic universe in one episode. So hold on to your seats because this one could be quite a doozy. We got a lot of people with a lot of opinions and uh, can't wait to get started with it. Uh, Let's just fucking jump in. Gary, since uh, this is kind of one that you really push for, um, I'm going to let you start out with kind of giving us a brief rundown of what Star Wars is, how it started, (coughs) And things like that. Okay, well, thank you, Johnny. I appreciate that. Um, So Star Wars uh, began in 1977 with the release of Star Wars. It was then later (laughs) retitled to uh, Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope. Um, And basically is the story of Luke Skywalker um, overcoming the bad guy and saving the princess Leia and destroying uh, the Death Star and defeating uh, Darth Vader. Then we move on to Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back, which is... uh, 1980 and uh luke skywalker and his friends uh are uh, they really get uh, the crap beat out of them by the empire and uh, they really put on their heels throughout the whole movie um his friend han solo gets captured by a bounty hunter and taken to job Hutt- alert <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's 40 years old <laughs> if you haven't seen it now it's your own fucking fault <laughs> uh and then 1983 brings us uh star wars um episode six the empire strikes back uh, luke skywalker and friends work to defeat the evil emperor and redeem luke skywalker's father anakin skywalker who is also bum 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 darth vader uh, moving into the uh, late 90s, we have uh, 1999's uh, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. So to preface this, these are, for I mean, I'm sure everybody listening has, but if they haven't, these are the prequels to the original. Yes, okay. so the, the first right. three movies are the original trilogy, and then you have the prequels, which are Episodes One: The Phantom Menace, where Anakin Skywalker, um, <clears throat> his backstory is explained and discovered. Um, somewhat. Somewhat. And then uh, Episode Two, uh, Attack of the Clones that discusses the Clone Wars, and then Episode 3, The Revenge of the Sith, which talks about uh, the Emperor and uh, taking over, and then Anakin choosing the path of the dark side to become Darth Vader. 
And then uh, you have the most frequ- uh, frequ- uh, recent, that's the word I'm looking there you for. Go. Yeah, <laughs> got it. Third time's the charm. <laughs> um, the, se- the sequel trilogy, uh, which starts off with episode seven, uh, The Force Awakens, which uh, sees a new character, uh, Ray, uh, come into focus and uh, her friends and how they're trying to uh, fight off the remnants of the. Uh, First Order, which are the remnants of the Empire, I suppose. And then Episode 8, The Last Jedi, which is Episode 9, which... uh, A uh, little, uh, little uh, animosity little, there little, towards little, uh, the thing. everybody that made that one. All right. Okay. Um, and then animosity you have episode least. nine, um, The Rise of Skywalker, which sees the conclusion of the storyline for the sequels. Now, I feel like there's an important there's important stuff that happens in, in The Last Jedi, so you seem to skip over it. No, really you're wrong. Quick. Oh, I am. Okay. Yes. All right, so nothing happens. It's just... It's just a, a blank screen for two hours. Oh, came out. They made you know hundreds of millions uh, of dollars. And then uh, a lot happens, but oh. nothing important. Okay, so uh, we're just willingly skipping the best one. Okay, cool. We cool. will. We will get to that. Trust me. <laughs> will don't, we? Don't All sure. right. Okay, Gary. So he okay. mentioned Empire. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> and so that's uh, that's kind of where the the main trilogies of movies are. And then throughout the years, you've had. Uh, two or if you want to consider three extra movies made um you've got uh the solo movie and then you've got the uh rogue one movie and solo was based off han, han solo, solo. Oh, yes right. and rogue one is uh an entirely new cast of characters that you've never seen before and it's them getting the plans to the death star and uh I guess the only other movie you'd say is the christmas special we're but not, we're not going to talk nope, about that nope and that's nope. isn't that a tv special Ah, it's it's very special. Whatever. I guess we're just gonna skip over the Ewok adventure and Ewok's battle no, for Endor. Neil, but okay, cool. Don't cool, forget cool, the cool. new uh, Lego Christmas special that's Jesus on Disney Christ. Plus. Which yeah, slaps. Yeah, the oh, the Lego <laughs> movies. Yeah, I actually like the Lego movies, but they're outside of the topic of discussion Out, for today. Outside. Well, of, no, there's an actual like Lego Star Wars that actually takes place after Episode Nine. It has like Ray training uh, Finn and everything. <laughs> Yeah, it's the Lego holiday special. <laughs> <laughs> oh, literally, that's what it's called. It's I the believe Lego Star Wars. I'm laughing because that's 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 funny. <laughs> that's good times. Uh, Gary, what about uh, what what series are uh, are going on or have been going on over the last? Okay, few well, um, you you've got the Clone War series, uh, which has been a, a very popular series. Um, it was on uh, Cartoon Network, I believe. In uh, the, in the storyline of Star Wars, where did that one land? Uh, that fell um, in episode two, kind of uh, e- explaining a little bit more of that story. Um, okay. uh, it expanded uh, off yeah. the movie. Okay. Yeah, and, right. and, and told Between more. Between two and three. Yes, okay. yeah. Right. And, and told more of the, the actual adventures of uh, Luke and, uh, not Luke, uh, Anakin and uh, Obi-Wan. And then you've got uh, the most recent, The Mandalorian, which has been uh, very popular, uh, which tells the story um, shortly after episode six, so after the Empire has fallen, and it's about a uh, Mandalorian um, bounty hunter that uh, finds a a baby Yoda. And uh, since that one's like fresh new, uh, we won't do any spoilers on it. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. All right, so for those of you that are listening that did not know anything about Star Wars. That's essentially, I mean, th- very well done, Gary, getting Thank that you. done Thank in you. under five minutes. Um, that's a lot of information to, to you know, to scrunch into such a small amount of time. Crinkle, crush, cram. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, so for this particular episode, what we do, for those of you that haven't joined us uh, before, we will go ahead and break this down from a purely film aspect to start out, and then we'll get into the actual plot and storyline, and then the universe itself. Um, that is where the majority, that is where, uh, in particular, Luke Spencer and Jacob, and actually Neil and Gary, everybody but me, um, is going to be able to actually give you a lot of information on the background of the universe itself, um, which has expanded to Jesus Christ. I don't know. Um, Neil, you, you used to read a bunch of the, the EU books right i mean like how many how many books did they write how many series did they have like of of those Uh, novels i mean they wrote a bunch i read a good handful which are obviously no longer canon uh (laughs) so thanks for wasting my time there kathleen kennedy but um uh yeah there's a lot of a lot of expanded universe stuff 
Yeah. yeah and di- then there's the sort of new expanded universe, air quotes, under Disney. And what? they're up to 30 plus novels and then uh, a ton of comics coming out through Marvel as well. Jesus yeah. Christ. And they just started the light, the whole High Republic era, which is like a few <laughs> centuries before what? Um, the original <laughs> trilogy. Got to yeah, make that money. Years before they, they, they spent four Jesus. and a half billion dollars on this franchise, Johnny. They got to milk it like that. Oh, yeah, mo- they are going to get every okay. dime possible. That's what that's what they bought it from. from milk it like Luke Skywalker Jesus, was milking man. that oh, thing. That blue milk. Oh, <laughs> nom, 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 nom. <laughs> All right, so we've got so fi- good. we've got fi- we've got five parts for tonight. We've got the original trilogy, the prequel trilogy, the sequel trilogy, Mandalorian and Clone Wars. We're gonna break it down, going through uh, <laughs> go through filming characters, plot, and then the entire franchise at the end. And that's where you guys and throughout this entire thing, um, we'll 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 go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, debate them. Um, let's jump into it early here um let's try to instead of movie by movie let's try to keep them in their clumps of trilogies trilogies came out um so spencer do you want to start with you since you have not been on with us before um since our our listeners are not terribly familiar with you um as far as filming itself goes starting with the originals we'll just go by when they were actually made um as far as we'll start with cinematography um sound special effects music you can go in any order you want um what are the what did you love? What did you hate about a lot of those aspects of the film? A lot of people consider these three, the first three, to be the creme de la creme, the best ones ever made. I don't know where you fall on that spectrum, um, but as far as the film aspects go, just from a pure cinematic standpoint, where do you think they stand against the rest of them, against other movies, other blockbusters? Uh, straight up filmmaking, they're they're the most solid of the bunch i would have to say and they're definitely the most complete trilogy where the others tend to fail especially the sequel trilogy i think is uh, as individual movies aside from the rise of skywalker you can kind of take them aside and enjoy them as individual stories but they don't quite feel uh they feel pretty disjointed as a trilogy especially the sequels but from a filmmaking standpoint uh, the originals, I think, are the best, which is one of the reasons uh, why we're sort of stuck in this cycle of continuously, well, they're not as good as the originals, and they're not as good as the originals. And a lot of that just goes back to you know, when people saw them and carrying the emotions of their childhood. Be like, is this one going to make you feel like you were six again? Unfortunately <laughs> not. Uh, but you know, that's uh, something for a therapist to work out. God knows the Star <laughs> Wars fandom needs therapy. <laughs> Lay back on your couch, kid. Tell me what's troubling you. Uh, so do you think that the original three, are they films that could have stood on their own without being a part of this universe? If, if we just threw Empire Strikes Back as one movie not connected to any type of larger universe on its own, could it have stood as a standalone film? Ooh, Empire's tricky because it, it's always tricky, especially when it's a, a film meant to be the middle chapter in a trilogy. Uh, Empire would be a, lif- a little difficult to stand alone because you would wonder, but wait a minute, we just found out this totally awesome uh, cliffhanger at the end. I, I got to know where that goes. There's no way that this is where this ends. But uh, it'd be a little bit of baptism by fire, especially trying to get caught up with the Battle of Hoth at the very beginning. But uh, from just a filmmaking standpoint, the Empire is one of the best, if not the best, of the Star Wars films. Uh, so you can probably put that thing in a vacuum and it'll be just fine. The Empire, Rogue One, and Last Jedi are probably the best from a pure film standpoint, at least for me. Interesting. Oh, Gary. Oh, Gary's grinding those teeth and shaking the head. I can't wait to get to Gary. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, whoever was about to say something. I was gonna, I'll jump in on this real fast because yeah. I saw trilogy in a little bit of a different way and speak to that point so i first saw i hated star wars growing up because everybody used to say luke i am your father whenever they would find out what my name was (laughs) and so i just knew like luke was from star wars fuck star wars i don't want anything to do with it but my friend told me i should watch it and his he had loaned out a new hope so he came over to my house and he had empire and um we were going to watch empire and jedi so my first star wars experience was watching empire strikes back and so like i remember moments of being like wait does luke when the falcon comes out um after darth vader comes in and shoots out and you see luke in the snow walking and he turns around i remember thinking wait does luke know what that ship is and who's in there but my point with all this is 
that was my first Star Wars experience, and I mm-hmm. fell in love right then and there. And I was a I was in third grade, and I saw it. And then I went back and watched Jedi, and then I went back the next weekend and we watched A New Hope. And it was like, oh, okay, that's how we met Han Solo. That's how we met Obi Wan Kenobi, who was actually alive at one point, apparently, which was kind of interesting for me to see. But all that Empire, I mean, f- to come in like that, Empire stands on its own in that regard because I came into it having mm-hmm. seen nothing and not even wanting to like Star Wars. And I was able to get into it and then go back and watch A New Hope. And, you know, obviously it stuck with me my whole life since then. Sure. Could you, do you think you could have done the same thing with um, Return of the Jedi? New Hope kind of is different because it was the first one made. But what about Return of the Jedi? Do you think had you seen that first, you would have felt the same way? I don't know. It's tough because Return of the Jedi is one of my favorites because the scene, the throne room scene with the Emperor and with Luke and Vader is just so good. You know, it's like it's like the culmination of of the whole trilogy, but it definitely wouldn't have the stakes if you don't know who Darth Vader is and you don't know about the Death Star and all that stuff. Right, right. But as a standalone movie, you know, you may be appreciated a little more, but I think you can still take it on its own. Like if you just saw what it was. Can still you can still get through it. I don't know if it holds up the way that A New Hope and Empire does, but no. but good, but but well enough. Uh, Gary, this this particular section, anyways, was yours, so I want to let you you speak to it. So as far as as far as cinematography, sound, special effects, the music, you know what is what is all. I know how you feel about the other ones, just mm-hmm. out of the, the countless hours upon hours that we've talked about. Right. Yeah. Years, but where do you feel that? as far as a cinematic checklist, the first uh, trilogy stands by on its own. Uh, I think uh, music, um, you know, music for me is going to be a very consistent rating because John Williams did, you know, the music <laughs> and greatest living composer. It's like he's the greatest yeah. composer of all time. Maybe. I don't know. Um, I mean, so uh, the music I think is thing. outstanding. Um, the uh, cinematography in the original trilogy, um, I think is really good and interesting because they have, especially back then when you didn't have special effects that, you know, people could just sit in a room and CGI them all up. You had to actually like build models and have accurate timing. Like it's really fun to watch. Sometimes the special effects, uh, didn't work. Um, didn't look very good. Like, um, in the empire strikes back when they're in the X wing and you can kind of see through the, uh, the wall of the X, X-Wing, you know, uh, that was before they remastered it, of course. But um, I, I think for its time, uh, it definitely was just really an extravaganza of special effects. Um, I think as we talked about on another podcast uh, last season, uh, you know, you had 2001 A Space Odyssey, which also right. had like really good special effects. But um, I think they were, they were top notch in the original trilogy. Um, and I, I think that like the the live action nature of it. Like there's, you know, real sand, you know, real, um, not real carbon scoring, but like there's real things to like touch, you know, and see. Um, I think that added a lot to, uh, the, the look and the feel of the film. And I think they nailed that pretty well. Okay. So yeah, you, and I know you had talked about, well, I guess I'll, I'll wait till we get till, to the prequels. Um, what you hated about that, uh, among many things. Um, Jacob, I want to jump to you cause I, I really, one of the reasons I love, I do actually like having you on is because you always oh do because <laughs> you always make me look good. No, um, because you, you always really like looking at the uh, the symbolism behind um, how they shoot particular scenes and how the story was written in comparison to, you know, current events at the time. Um, so for you, for the filming aspects of the initial three, um, where do you think they fall? Not even just in line with the entire series, but just in line with modern cinema over the last 50 years. Oh, I don't think we would have modern cinema without Star Wars, really. Um, okay, why is that? Like, J- Jaws was the first blockbuster, right? But it was very much a genre film. It was horror. It was kind of dark, depressing in a lot of ways, but also like kind of an ura ending. But you look at the 70s and like 60s, like films were just like really dour and like mean, dirty, hairy. You have the Death Wish films, uh, Taxi Driver. It was just a terrible time and just like rampant crime. And then like Star Wars gave hope to people, like literally a new hope. And it broke uh, like it broke through the mainstream and just like gave people an imagination they hadn't seen before on the big screen, like bringing like silly sci fi 
like Flash Gordon type stuff to the big screen, but in a more serious manner. And with like these extravagant special effects, uh, the practical effects are fantastic. Um, the music score, just everything uh, surrounding Star Wars, like film wouldn't be with it, what it is without it. Um, it modernized the blockbuster. It, and every film since has been trying to recapture that magic. It's just like, we want to make this Star Wars. Like the stupid Green Lantern movie of 2011 was like, <laughs> we want this to be Star Wars. Everything like the Wachowskis, uh, what was that? Jupiter Ascending. We want this to be Star Wars. It's like everything yeah, wants to be that, Star yeah. Wars. Right, right. And I think you I think you had actually brought up, you brought up do- David Lynch's Dune uh, in our last episode, yes. I think, right? Yeah, and we had actually just, I had just gotten done doing a podcast with Ian about movies so bad they're good and this being on that spectrum. Um, in my opinion, that movie was just so bad it was fucking awful. Yeah, um, and they wanted that to be Star Wars. <laughs> right, and I mean, it's just Even like... David Lynch is like... Yeah, he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He was, he was just, Whoops. it was just, you can't take us, you can't take this, what, a, a space western or whatever that Star Wars is, pretty family friendly. And you can't take this mm. super dark, morbid adult graphic novel, it almost seemed like. I know it wasn't graphic novel, but mm. um, you can't take that and then expect it to be, yeah, the next Star Wars. It just, it didn't make any damn sense. Um, yeah. So, Neil, I guess this, so all these questions to you, I mean, out of people I know, I mean, you're certainly one that has seemed to gobble this up the most. I mean, hell, you've got a fucking r- r- resistance or rebel decal on the back of your truck. You know, I mean, that's that's that you've just been doing this for a long time. What do you what's so special to you about this series? What makes it stand out, you know, over the course of your cinematic v- viewing history? Well, I mean, obviously, for me, it relies heavily just on nostalgia factor, just, you know, going back to being a kid and watching this with, you know, my dad, but looking at it now, the star Wars, the original three movies are just to me, great cinematic adventures. Uh, you know, it tells a story, tells a good story. Um, I love how all three are reliant on the previous one. Yeah. They can be good standalones return of the Jedi. You can not have watched the first two, and you can realize, okay, well, these people are busting out Han Solo. I guess he's one of them, and it still makes sense as far as the story goes. Okay. Yeah. But uh, as you know, Gary said, these three movies have great um, scores. John Williams did an excellent job scoring these movies. Um, they've all done so well standing the test of time. Uh, like uh, Jacob just said, every movie tries to emulate something in the Star Wars universe. Um, sure. But, you know, for me, just watching that opening text scroll uh, <laughs> just takes me back. And I just think these three are, are just classic cinemas. So, so, and yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, for at least for these three, I'd have to agree with as far as the, I think the cinematography, if we, we, we go into that portion, obviously at the time, and for, for those of you that, that listen and that don't know, yeah, these were some of the most expensive cameras Hollywood had ever used. I don't remember the model name on these, but, that they had ever ever had access to they used on star wars it was one of the first films to have might have to go back and look to see what the model number was um but whatever that's not super interesting um (laughs) but something that's always been crazy to me is that the special effects in this this the the first movie came out in in the 70s gary 77 you said 77 77 77 okay so how do those graphics still stand up even like I remember seeing the the uh, prequels and I remember being like, well, the graphics in the first one are better than these. How the hell are they doing this? How, how do I mean, I don't I don't know. Jacob, I don't I know, you know, a lot of background, a lot, a lot of this stuff. I don't or Spencer, maybe or Luke even. I don't know. Do, do any of you guys know, like any tricks that they were using or I mean, were, well, go ahead. Well, I think I don't know. For me, I think that the CG always ages really bad mm-hmm. and you can always tell. You know, that's why George Lucas did three different versions of the special edition. There's three different Mm -hmm. versions of Jabba the Hutt, you know, talking to Han Solo outside the Falcon. Um, And, you know, as bad as those models might look, they're still real. They're still tactile. And there's something about that. Like, even as a kid, I remember watching A New Hope and seeing those shots of the X-Wing flying and thinking, yeah, something looks a little bit off about that. I'm not sure what it is. It looks a little small or something, but it at least was physical and it was real and the lighting was right. You know what I mean? There's something that that uncanny valley is real. And I think that 
I think part of the reason that the original trilogy holds up is that those practical effects, you know, as cheesy as they look, they do work pretty well. And I think if you can see that if you look at The Force Awakens, is that, you know, whatever you can say about the writing and stuff is that the special effects, that the way that they kind of merge the practical and the digital, it works really, really well. Uh, but when you look at the prequels, that CG does not age well at all. And to like, to your point, Johnny, the the practical effects in the original trilogy in some cases still, although you, they're not perfect, they still hold up better oh, yeah. than watching the video game cutscenes that basically every shot of the prequel trilogy. Absolutely. Uh, is there any, is there anything else as far as if you've got, if you have the cinematic checklist, um, is there anything else outside of special effects and probably story, I would say that kind of jumps out to you guys that still holds up with the original three 50 years later. Or, yeah, yes, I do. Later. I will say this real quick, and then I'll be off. It is okay. um, sound. Ben Burt on sound. Okay. Mm-hmm. So much of Star Wars, the Tie Fighters, the 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 twin eye, the yeah, the laser, <laughs> the the way the lasers sound on the Tie Fighters, the way the lasers sound on the X Wing, the way the 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 sound of the Stormtrooper armor clacking when they run. So much of the sound, and you see this in the prequel trilogy too, when Jango Fett drops those sonic chargers, or where the first time the N one fires those proton torpedoes, and you hear that. The sound is so good and it goes so well with the special effects and you see what it's like when Ben Burt's not there on the sequel trilogy, how sort of unremarkable the the audio the audio design is. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the, the you can yeah you know you can totally tell the whoever uh, this gentleman who had who is I guess was the Foley artist. Um, yeah, I mean he created something that's memorable. That's going to last for decades. You know, I'm, yeah, I was going to say real quick to, to Luke's point, just yeah. think of how many just individual noises that you mm-hmm. hear in your entry. Yeah, yeah. Death Lord, like I still think of the, uh, the yeah. boom of charging up the Death Star laser. Yeah, uh, exactly. Vader breathing. They made oh, bre- they yeah. made a guy breathing. An asthmatic dude is iconic <laughs> because of the sound of Star Wars. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's amazing. And then. Uh, of course, just John fucking Williams and his amazing yeah, music. Yeah, the music throughout. <laughs> uh, and uh, to your point about the the different sound in the tr- uh, the sequels too. The first time you hear a lightsaber ignite in the prequels, it's like, or sorry, in the the sequels, it's like watching a bootleg DVD. You're like, something <laughs> about this is just not right. I can't put my finger on it, but it's wrong. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and we've seen those cuts. You know, they're online. If you watch star wars without the music it's like et without the music it's just awful and you know to to when i don't know if you guys remember when george lucas got the uh lifetime achievement award the the first thing he did was he got up there and he said i want to thank john williams because if it weren't for him these would just be be b-grade science fiction and nobody really care and if you remember on the behind the scenes feature of the phantom menace when they're doing the first kind of cut viewing somebody is talking to george lucas in the viewing room and he says hey man you got to they're not going to be watching the movie they're going to be listening to the music and then everybody in the room kind of starts laughing because you know he's got all his chuckle huts with him his yes men (laughs) but you know that music man that stuff stands up like you can't movies are essentially a music video to john williams's sweets you know what i mean like it's so so much a part of what the presentation is yeah so much that like uh, even if you hate the prequels, you can't say that the soundtracks are bad for those movies. Like those soundtracks are iconic, mm-hmm. especially even every prequel has Duel of the Fates. Yeah, iconic. And every one has like you can go to Duel of the Fates in The Phantom Menace. You can go to the March of the Clones in the arena or you can go to the final duel in Revenge of the Sith with Obi-Wan and Ken. But every one of them has at least one standout piece of music. We're like, God damn, that was great. Yep. So, so I think we can. So, no, that's that's fantastic. I think we can all agree that yeah, the first the first three were were probably the strongest as a whole. I would say that's probably a general consensus. So, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Johnny. Uh, and also the matte paintings. I think uh, if we're going to mention yes, the special yes, effects, yes, just yes, the matte yes. paintings themselves mm-hmm. lend a big hand into bringing Star Wars to life. Just the that's scope true. and scale they they managed to pull off, like the twin suns matte painting right there. Uh, the Death Star, Aldron, just the way they were able to like utilize that, and it still looks fresh and neat today. Instead of like something like at the end of uh, the prequel tri- or of Episode Two, Attack of the Clones, where you see all the clones getting in the ship, it just, just it looks so bad. 
because uh, it's all computer generated. But if they had done like quick matte painting, it would have looked so cool. Matte paintings are so underrated. I don't know about you guys, but I can't tell you how many times if you've ever been out, I mean, go to Enchanted Rock, go anywhere and you look off in the landscape and you're like, wow, this is just like a painting. And it goes back to that thing is those tactile special effects hold up like there's map even on Jaws, right? That was still that's a yeah. little inland, but that stuff still holds up. It still looks real. But that. Gee, man, you could pick that shit out from 10 miles away. It's just it's an eyesore. And it's just, you know, it's like a cat playing with something shiny. You just get the impression that George Lucas was, you know, as Ian Malcolm said, your scientists were so preoccupied with what they could do. They didn't stop to think they should. I, I will say that. And it's funny you brought up Ian Malcolm. Uh, Jurassic Park's CGI held up for a very long time. Like the Brontosaurus. It's a mix. It's a yeah. mix. It's mostly practical robots, a couple of nighttime writing shots with the CG, There's nighttime writing so that they can make sure that, you know, that it can be a little sloppy. But that's one of the good things about Jurassic Park is Steven Spielberg was very smart about using as many robots and as many of, of uh, Stan Winston's models and his robot robotronics as he could. Because there's only there's basically the fence breakout and then there's the walking over to the car and then there's the eating of the lawyer. But there's a couple of scenes that are all pure CG in the car chase. But the rest of it is giant robotic T-Rex that they had to fucking deal with on set, you know? Well, I, I mean, like the, the Brontosaurus at the beginning when uh, it's eating from the tree like that to me. It, it's starting to look a little aged, but like that still looked good. Yeah. Still 25 years. That's to hold up for two yeah. and a half decades. That's pretty, that's pretty, pretty good. good. Yeah. That's pretty yeah. legit. So as far as, I mean, I mean, hell, okay. So 20 years, you know, 20 years later, we start seeing the next. And so I guess for, for this portion up, we'll just stick to the, the nine movies and then we'll, we'll break off at the end with the series and the, um, the, the two, uh, row one and solo, but, <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. Uh, with the prequels, <laughs> as far as the filming aspect goes, right. um, with all with with all of those elements on that checklist we talked about, um, where does this where 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 does where do they hold up? And that's so that's Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Just making sure I had that right. Um, Neil, let's start with you on that one. Um, do you think? I know you you find these ones to be pretty week right i mean where do you think they got anything right with with any of our checklists compared to the first the first three i mean uh the music is the music and sound are still there for okay, sure. sure but i think uh george lucas when he decided to go back and do these three uh everyone was like oh my god he's the creator of star wars just let him do whatever he wants and <laughs> uh it ended up not working uh you know <laughs> the fact that, you know, the opening scene of Phantom Mentis, they're like, oh, we got diplomats coming to negotiate a trade federation dispute. It's like, hold on, what? Um, but besides the sound and the, and the, and the music, I, I think overall this is probably my least favorite of the series. It is your least favorite. Okay. All right. Interesting. Um, Spencer, where are you at with this one? Uh, I've... I feel like always been a uh, air quotes prequels apologist, uh, but I don't <laughs> really know if the prequels need apologizing for necessarily. Really? I think part of this is, and and they haven't aged as well, certainly uh, as the original trilogy. And a big part of that is the CGI that definitely dates it. When you see the prequels and you're like, okay, that's, you know, late nineties, early 2000s CGI. I know what right. that looks like. Um, <laughs> But things that the prequels got right, uh, we're, I don't think we're going to spend five minutes of this podcast no. not talking about John Williams. So I'm going to say John Williams again. Uh, but uh, the best lightsaber combat that we saw in any Star Wars trilogy uh, was in the prequels. Uh, and kudos to okay. uh, gents like Hayden Christensen and um, Ewan McGregor for actually doing those lightsaber combat scenes. <laughs> Uh, so fantastic uh, combat scenes. The music was wonderful. Uh, and I could watch you and McGregor be Obi-Wan Kenobi for days on end. OK, all oh, right. That's true. He's green. All right. I, I would like to really quick before I move on to, to we'll, we'll jump to Luke in a second. But I, I want to open this up really quick. Best lightsaber duels you're saying are are in the prequels. Does anybody disagree with that? So are we saying best in terms of like choreography or yeah yeah, yeah the from, stakes 
stakes matter. Like, it's not just how good is the choreograph. It's like, how much do I give a fuck about the fact stakes that matter, which is stakes matter, which is why for my money, it, I, one of the classic, I think, debates, especially if you're just looking at the prequels, is which was better, Duel of the Fates or Obi-Wan versus Anakin? And it's the stakes of Obi-Wan versus Anakin that makes that the superior lightsaber battle. Okay. Uh, Obi-Wan versus Anakin, I don't think it gets better than. Uh, and then as far as just uh, the actual you know, choreography, it was second to none, except for I do have a, a deep love of the, for lack of a better word, throne room fight. <laughs> in uh last jedi uh that was wonderful but uh yeah duel the fates and obi-wan versus anakin like yeah i have argue against them with obi-wan versus anakin though is it, it's about 10 minutes too long though you know what i mean like like there's so much of that fight where it's like you don't need this yeah you don't need this we don't need this i get it they're fighting we don't need like the minute the shields go down and the lava starts and like it's like we don't need that i understand that this has to be like the fight to end all fights because this is obi-wan versus anakin but it went way too deep on that and it gets mind numbing it's to the point where it's just like i just don't care anymore i've just what else can they do like there's no stakes they're literally jumping onto two by two platforms in the middle of lava. Like if that was all that it was, that would be awesome. But it's that, and then jumping onto another plane. And it's just the constant escalation is to the point where it's just like, okay, there's nothing. They're always gonna make it. And I mean, I love that fight too. I love the music, but I definitely think they could have trim. They could have trimmed out about eight minutes from that, and it would have been much more effective. You know, everybody is the soul of wit. Right. I, I think towards the end, it definitely, like you said, that moment, it is a real pivotal moment in the fight when the, the shields go down. It begins to get very long winded at the end there. But I've always felt like the length of that fight really just spoke. It helped enhance the fact that these are two guys who know each other so damn well that they just can't beat the other because they've seen everything that you that the other one has. Uh, and I, it just yeah, sort of yeah. to the tragedy of literally I'm trying to murder this guy that I view as a brother. Uh, and I ca- and in Obi-Wan's case, I have to or else we're fucked. Right. And I agree. And obviously that's what I'm trying to do. I just think I think you could convey that if you were much smarter about what you did with your screen time. You could do that in 12 minutes. You don't need 22. I think that it's kind of ironic that the uh, the duel at the end of episode Three, it, it's so long and drawn out. It's like just eating icing on a cake, and that's all you eat is the icing. Like it just gets yeah. old and after a while. Indulgent. Whereas if you compare that battle that Obi Wan and Anakin had uh, with the battle that they had thirty years later, well, th- but thirty years earlier in our time, like in in uh, Episode Four, No right. Hope, that one's got a lot more going on with it. Even though it's just like an an old man. Uh, uh, <laughs> And then a guy who can't see out of his mask, try, just kind of <laughs> slapping swords. It's it's not technically as interesting to watch, but yeah, knowing knowing the knowing what's going on there, it, it's much it's much more powerful to me. I think. Okay. Well, it's and all, I don't know. All right, go ahead. I was going to say also in canon, it's 19 years after. Uh, episode three, which has always been one of the sort of critiques of be like, man, how did they get that old? That Obi quick? aged horribly. Tatooine's a terrible <laughs> place to live. He's a Scot living in the desert for 19 yeah, years. Yeah, it's no. not going to go well. That's forgivable. That's one of those things where it's like, look, that's just the fact that this is a business and that's a movie that's been, you know what I mean? Alec Guinness can't fight. What do you want? But I'll say this, you know, I don't, to that point, I, don't, I think the Empire Strikes Back is probably the template for a good lightsaber fight as far as the stakes being escalated in a way that's not irrational but also in a way that makes the audience understand that there actually are stakes here and um i I would apply that my favorite lightsaber fight is the return of the jedi one because i love forced i love luke being green and being essentially master of his domain you know i mean as close as we see until mandalorian of him being master of his domain but I do think they rushed it. I think you could have had another minute or two of Luke kind of toying with the dark side. Again, I think 
you know, going back to Empire Strikes Back, it seems like that's a good template as for what the pacing and the length needs to be. Doesn't have to exactly hit the same beats, but the progression is logical. The stakes escalate in a way that makes sense, and it seemed and that Obi Wan Anakin fight is it just it gets so absurd and it gets just it's just mind numbing and to the point where it's just like I can't I'm just there's so much stimulation here that I'm just going to shut down because I just can't no matter what happens Obi-Wan's going to win I know Obi-Wan's going to win so I'm just going to basically run out the clock and wait for that sequence because that's really what I'm interested in yeah. sounds like you guys have never played Metal Gear Solid 4 <laughs> oh, I have <laughs> not <laughs> god that's a long winded ending it's literally a f- fist fight on top of a submarine for like half an hour mm. Mm. metal gear solid games are very very interesting yeah. but not part of our conversation today no not tonight right. uh, so so no 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 it's it's fine i i wanted to go off on that because i wanted to hear where everybody's thoughts were on because uh, i mean the lightsaber duels are obviously one of the most iconic portions of this entire franchise um, I mean, hell, they've been selling them just just as toys to kids for for decades on end. Um, so let's continue on with uh, with the filming portion of the prequels. Luke, I wanted to jump to you really quick um, as far as just cinematic ch- checklist. Same thing. Um, I think falling. Where does the prequels fall short? I think is kind of an obvious answer on where you're welcome to touch it on it if you want to. But do you think there's anywhere that they were uh, they were better than the original three or maybe on par with at least? Well, I mean, I don't know. I think the beginning and the end of the discussion about the prequels is that they were really good concepts and they were just executed not that well. And I think you could have, you know, this has been said before, but I think it's basically true. If George Lucas had had a J.J. Abrams or maybe even a Ryan Johnson, but if he'd had somebody there with him, uh, I think it would have gone a little bit differently. I love the, the overview of this is how Palpatine took over because I love Palpatine. He's just so juicy. He's so he's one of the best villains of all time. He's a juicy man. And just anytime Ian McDermott can just be on screen, I'm just I'm I'm so happy for that. And you know, as as a wise person once said, Palpatine was the only character that wasn't ruined by the prequels. It just made him that much more delightful and delicious. And so I'm down for seeing more of him, but it's just his rise and all that stuff that's all great but i just think there's so there's so much from a filmmaking standpoint from execution pacing and i mean again this has been said before but every single it's like a video game every single every single movie is action sequence and then dialogue scene with shot reverse shot and then action sequence and then dialogue scene with shot reverse shot and it's like a lucas hearts game is so far as like how mechanical and like completely uninspired the presentation is but i like the themes and i like the ideas and i like the character design and i like the artwork and i like the music you know what i mean there's just people dog on the prequels because the execution is so bad but again you know if you'd had two or three of the right people in the right places it could have gone from zero to hero i think that could be said yeah for sure that could be said of a lot of films that were just not done as well as the initial one you know um but i won't go into this right now but uh gary where are you at with that well, yeah, I, and I don't know if we made it clear, but um, obviously for the the prequels, uh, with the filming standpoint, uh, using so much CGI and not having anything real um, made it all seem so sterile mm. and so clean. I wonder and what percentage of green screen they human. used. Probably they 90, 95%. Okay. Like, all right, that's... <laughs> no, I mean, like, most of that thing was green screen. Like, as much as George Lucas could put green screen, he did in CGI. And saved him a lot of money. Well, make uh, it as dense as possible. Mm-hmm. Throw as much shit on the screen as possible. Yeah. Every single frame, there's so much going on. Yes, it's every, it's so like dense. poetry. It rhymes. Rhymes. But, <laughs> but like, uh, like it, there's just it loses its its humanity and its connection when it's so so sterile and so um, not grounded Horribly in reality. Written. Yeah. Well. You know, yeah, yeah. but like it, like you don't have it's your, like your, the last Jedi. your actors can't, you know, relate to what they're doing because they're just standing in a large blue or green area, you know, and there's a mark on the wall and they're like, General Grievous is there. And they're like, Who, I don't know what he looks like. I don't know. He's that tall. OK. You know, and I I can't react to Imagine what he's doing. What he looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Use your imagination yeah, there's a thing here. <laughs> yeah, it's just a tennis ball stuck up on a wall. Uh, <laughs> some, some guy just threw up there with tape on it. But like, um. 
you know, it, it, the and, and as, as you said, you know, the 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 shot counter shot which is a B camera for all the dialogue scenes Two people sitting down, you know, in episode one, it's uh, Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan having tea and discussing trade disputes. I mean, what an exciting movie for children. And then yeah, you might get a cross stage every now and then, yeah, but then you'll cut immediately to a, a reverse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or Padme uh, crossing, uh, you know, the bed and putting a, a dress in her suitcase or whatever, but it's just, it's, it's all, flat angles, very un- uninspired. And, you know, the, you know, it, it, it's, it's well produced, so it looks good, but it's, it's just high budget. I don't know if it's yeah. well produced. I mean, well, I mean like nothing looks cheap. Um, the, yeah, the background looks <laughs> fake because sure. they chose not to make like CGI everything, but like right. there, there's nothing that looks like, Oh, this is just like a, you know, well, you know, I take that back cause they did just have like a, what was it in episode one? They just had a uh, like one of those not a racquetball mitten, but like something that was just hanging in uh, the oh uh, for Jar Jar yeah oh no yeah, in, yeah. The, in Watto's shop right yeah, talking Watto. about the racket yeah yep 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 um, but I mean like yeah it, it just it's it's not inspiring and Star Wars is about adventure and inspiring hope and it's just so corporate i guess okay they just wanted to remake the money that they the success they they wanted to recapture the success that they had with the first three and so right. they just yeah let lucas do what he wanted to yeah i mean you know there's i mean i mean hell we've talked about you know blumhouse would they've actually taken that model <laughs> and had a lot of success with it you know letting the letting the creative visionaries just have complete artistic control mm-hmm. and letting them just run the budget how they want and very little interference from top level producers right um so yeah so i mean it's i guess it's one of the one of the few examples where it didn't work unfortunately that's uh, easy to do you know? when you have no budget you know what i mean yeah i mean yeah their budget's a couple million it certainly wasn't you know what they had for the singular star wars films that's for sure right, like when you're uh, dealing absolutely. with star wars which is hundreds of millions of dollars like people there's so many hands in the pie you know right yeah there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of input and maybe they just maybe they didn't know i mean they had had such great success with the first three you know it was like trial by error. Oh, we didn't do yeah. so well in Phantom Menace. It's okay. Attack of the Clones. He'll he'll figure it out. Ah, oh, we didn't do so great. Well, there's only one left. We can't we can't substitute him now. Yeah, you know we got to just finish he owns it up. everything. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, where are you at with uh with with the film of the prequels? Is there anything in there that that stands up to par with the initial three or anything that's better? Um, oh, I think the, the uh, I think when it comes to production design, art design, uh, ship design. Okay. I think the prequels are actually pretty fucking awesome. Um, Chang, man. Like just the pod race sequence itself, like to me, is the best part of episode one. Um, yeah, sure, the lightsaber fight at the end is cool, but man, nothing, nothing beats hearing like Anakin's uh, pod racer boot up, and then also bringing back memories of like playing uh, speed or pod racer on N sixty four. And it so much so that whenever the horses popped up in Last Jedi, I was like, oh man, is this a pod race? And then the horses like showed up instead, and I was like. I was super bummed out. Um, But just the art design, like Padme's clothing throughout most of episode one and like even episode two are pretty fucking dope. Uh, Just the uh, costumes themselves, everyone looks cool. They actually kind of, uh, that that was like the first time we had a defined version of what a Jedi would look like, really. Like, sure, Obi-Wan kind of had the outfit in the first two, but it just felt like a throw on while this one was very much just like, oh, this is the Order of the Jedi. They're all wearing robes, very much like monks. Yeah. Um, same with the an... Sith. What was that? That didn't make any sense, though. That was one of the things that bothered me was because Owen and Baru Lars are wearing the same robes. Like Obi-Wan right. was wearing that robe because it's Tunisia and it's the desert. And then George was like, well, Obi-Wan wore this robe, so let's make them all wear this robe. And then the audience will know that they're Jedis. Don't bother yeah, me. I'm and sitting drinking with my coffee. Whole... <laughs> yeah, like they, it, there's like little petty things in there, you know, like like younglings instead of children. It's just like, why the fuck don't you just call them kids? Because you, don't, you, want, call them you don't want to have your protagonist say, he's gone back to kill the children in a children's film. It, just, <laughs> it doesn't work well. <laughs> But if you say so young like, ones, he's like, slaughtering yeah. all of them. And then, yeah, of course, like the rat tail that appears in episode two with Anakin. I mean, I guess Obi-Wan had it in episode one, but man, you saw everyone afterwards just wearing the rat tail. And it's like, can we get rid of this fad already? Mm-hmm. Um, but That's just bad... like. Go ahead. Oh, nothing, nothing. 
but yeah, just the well, everyone's already mentioned like the sound and John Williams and stuff. But yeah, just like the production design, the art design, I think is fantastic for the uh, first three films. We it's just a shame that it's all covered up with digital effects. Um, and even like the more practical effects that they use for it, like um, you all have to help me. The planet that's in episode three, where uh, Obi-Wan faces off against Grievous. They used a practical, yeah, they used a practical um, cave system for it. Like they built that entire model set to like shoot the camera through it. But like they just pour digital effects over it to the point where you can't even tell that it's actually like practical. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really disappointing. And I mean, that's most of those movies. But uh, the prequels themselves, I actually genuinely like Revenge of the Sith. Uh, it still has its own array of bullshit. I just think those films are terribly written, and I have some of the most cringy lines uh, I've ever seen in, in a, a major blockbuster. Like, just the entire table sequence between Anakin and Padme is cringy as fuck. No, it's because I'm so in love Tough. with you. See, that's episode three. Yeah. That's bad, too. Yeah. But the entire Talk part where the he's like... Pair. Uh, yeah. The floating pair. And it's just like, <laughs> this is your creeper, dude. And like, how he's like dreaming about about you and like watching you and it's like this is well doesn't, no. doesn't the whole prequel trilogy i mean you know jordan marsha lucas basically saved i think you know and this has kind of been documented yeah, saved a new I, hope I in know. editing yeah right and, and, and i think that's one of the reasons Shut that up, he Greg. doesn't want to release the original <laughs> cut is because i'm sure there's some credits with marsha lucas on there and he's like fuck that bitch i'm never gonna give her anything <laughs> because of the divorce but um yeah but sorry gary what were you gonna say Oh, I was just saying they fixed it in post because Johnny always uh, hates that phrase, but <laughs> it's, it's always true. It's because it's a bad fucking idea. You cannot always... Gary, you're an editor. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know that you can't and do I that. And I have to fix so much shit in post I know. all and the time. Yet you're, you're the only one that says it. Neil and I always tell you not to say it, but you do it anyway. Well, I just want people to understand that that's what they're doing when they put the shit on oh, celluloid. For God's sake. All right, moving on. Uh, <laughs> let's go to the sequels really quick. Um, <laughs> we'll kind of brush through characters because i want to get to plot of all these um so as, as so let's let's loop back around um uh jacob we'll start with you since we ended with you last time with the sequels where are we at with that one i mean now we're, we're 40 years later the the advantage that they have with special effects the advantage that they have with e an even bigger budget the advantage they have with the equipment being newer and being able to shoot uh in a in a higher rate of frame with the cameras and the lenses you know it it looks crisper even without trying mm. that hard where are they at as far as production value with the sequels i mean the the, new, the newest three. Oh, i think they look damn good okay. um depending on how you feel about them i just think there's like iconic shots and uh even just design that's incredible in those films like last jedi is like just a painting in general just the use of red and black throughout most of that film just the, there's red of create the red of the throne room yeah, the art direction was well it's done just, yeah it's so good and then even like tfa just the use of colors throughout that movie like uh one thing i noticed while watching even uh force awakens uh it encompasses all three uh, geographical locations <laughs> of the original trilogy, right? Starts in a desert, uh, they go to a jungle planet, and then they also go to a snow planet. So it <laughs> encompasses all three. So there's like this really great use of different environments throughout all of The Force Awakens, sort of just like jet, like jet propulsion you through uh, the original trilogy real quick. As for, like, Because I mean, that whole entire movie is just an homage to New Hope, right? But it's also encompassing like the rest of the trilogy, just like, it's a quick refresher. Let's get everyone back on board for Star Wars. I mean, the movie even starts with, uh, this will begin to set things right, right? And like, it's literally the first thing that's said after the title scroll. This will begin to set things right because everyone felt so cheated by the prequels. Mm -hmm. And while TFA, like, it's still, it looks incredible. Like, even the first shot of Kylo Ren, like, stopping the the blaster bolt in the air, just, like, was incredible. And the sound, the use of sound, too, like, uh, like, I hated hearing Bane in The Dark Knight Rises, right? But anytime Kylo Ren spoke through his mask, it, I thought it was dope. I, I, like, I would got chills. And then hearing the Force when he's, like, uh, even torturing, like, uh, Ray or... Uh, Oh, Poe Dameron. Mm -hmm. It's like, just like the use of that, I thought was pretty cool. Um, the sound of those mil those films, like I think uh, John Williams' score is a little 
uh, phoned in, under, phoned in, but a little <laughs> underused, right? Like I think Ray's theme is the best of them of that film in particular. Well, the last, yeah, well, and then like the piano, it's that stuff is great, but the rest of the film, I couldn't like couldn't tell you a single thing outside. Well, Kylo Ren's theme is great, but I don't think it gets better until like the sequel, like the Last Jedi and Rise of Skywalker, and I I genuinely enjoy um uh, last jedi quite a lot i think it's it's up there in some of my favorites does this have its problems yes but i think like symbolically that movie hits home f- for me in a lot of ways personally uh-huh yeah oh, baby uh, yeah all right i love you Jacob. Um, we have to be best friends and, I, I knew going, inviting you on here was a good idea yeah <laughs> and even going back to favorite lightsaber battles it's like yeah i actually do love the anakin and obi-wan fight and i love the throne room fight in last jedi but i personally love the kylo and luke fight at the end mostly because they don't lock lightsabers once and i genuinely love that because it's never been done in a star wars movie where two lightsabers don't actually lock against each other and i thought that was so cool and even in the uh, the throne room scene like i can't remember kylo or ray actually hitting each other with lightsabers it was just like it was such a unique decision to just have lightsabers not touch one another in those right. movies in that movie in particular sorry uh, Rise of Skywalker, major disappointment. Uh, it's kind of funny because it's just like it, they just felt like they had to reverse everything the Last Jedi did, going to so p- far as to point it out in the film that C-3PO can't remember what happened uh, <laughs> after Last Jedi or after Force Awakens, thereby erasing the Last Jedi. It's just like I just they just needed their own Kevin Feige to sort of show like have a set plan in a way. But that didn't happen. Um, it did though. They had a plan, and Ryan Johnson came in and said, "I don't want to do that." I well, did to. they really? Because well, they, 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 they kind of left it. That. Daisy Ridley said, "JJ JJ Abrams wrote an outline for the second and the third. Mm-hmm. Ryan came in and did his own script and threw out everything." Daisy, Daisy Ridley said that in an interview. Hmm. So right. they had a plan. Ryan was too good for the plan, and look where that happened. Well, that well, that's that's but that's I like fran- his that's, direction. Though. That's franchise. Well, yeah, that's franchise and well plot. Franchise. That's franchise and plot, and we will get to that in a second. But, but that's do- the thing, though. It's mm-hmm. like if they adhered to even like, but that's that goes back to the directors not sharing each other's visions, right? Like, yeah, sure. Right, exactly. Ryan made him. Ryan made a mistake of just not following JJ's plan. Like, but even then, J, like, why didn't JJ just well, even the, everything? Even that, like, was wasn't he, he like? Did why didn't he stay along? That was because Kathy was said of, this is what we're gonna do, and JJ didn't give a fuck, so he was like, okay, well, whatever. Yeah, yeah. but uh, but that's that goes back to it. It's just like Rise of Skywalker. So much of Force Awakens feels like it's trying to get away from the prequels, right? Mm-hmm. While Rise yeah, of Skywalker specifically. Well, Rise of Skywalker delves heavily into the prequels. It delves heavily, like the the word Sith is not even mentioned in The Force Awakens, but Sith is used constantly know. out throughout Rise of Skywalker. Like they're putting in wayfinders, they're talking about like the Jedi texts, and it's just like what this this tr- this trilogy hasn't done that till this point, and just the the br- like bringing back Palpatine, which they tease just in the eight, Force Awakens so art book. Uh-huh. Yeah, and it's like that's another thing. It's like half of that was brought up in the art book for Force Awakens. Like we kind of wanted to bring back Palpatine and this, and then it's just like you guys should have just had a co- like just a surefire cohesive vision from the get go. Sure. Um, but but Rise of Skywalker major disappointment. Uh, even where it left a lot of its characters, there's surely great moments. I I think the lightsaber battle on the on the second Death Star is pretty beautiful. And I like watching Kylo Ren just come out of the waves crashing with his with his lightsaber. And also Kylo Ren's lightsaber, I think, is like probably my favorite lightsaber besides Luke's green lightsaber. OK, that's the right. And by the way, that is <laughs> Luke's lightsaber. There is only one Luke Skywalker lightsaber and people confuse yes. Anakin's <laughs> lightsaber. Yes. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about. I'm absolutely with you, man. Luke's and also I Luke's has that. just like. This was your has father's. a definitive sound. Oh, that's the way it screams. That sharp, yeah, it's perfect. It's perfect. So let's you can tell it's like homemade, but it's like better. So. Yeah. So let's 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 jump. So 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 super love it, Jacob. Super in depth. So um so Luke, Sorry, I know you're I on the, got a little no no it's carried away. it's 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 perfect. I'm glad you did. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sprinkle in um because I know people are on opposite ends, especially with Last Jedi and kind of how the the best of. The best of the worst, I guess, outside of the front three. So, Luke, I'm going to go to you, um, since you were already kind of jumping in with that. As far as from just technical cinematic standpoint um, that Jacob was going off of, can you 
kind of give us your your two cents on that because it sounded like you did not agree completely on the sequel trilogy as a whole yeah on the sequel trilogy as a whole as far as their production value you know i mean he had state he just stated well, i mean that obviously the production value is extraordinarily high um uh, i mean just based on the list we've got here i mean i will say this uh, you know all the the, but I think the best cine- cinematography in the entire series mm-hmm. is probably in The Last Jedi. I okay. mean, there's wow. I cannot spit at Ryan Johnson's directorial ability. Um, I think he's an idiotic writer. But I can't <laughs> argue with how beautifully the shots are set up and with how well the the color palette is done and ev- everything. Like from from a functional standpoint, especially from cinematography, okay. um, that film is damn near perfect. Uh, there's not a shot that I think is set up that is wasted insofar as the efficiency of what you see on screen and every single little shirt or shoe or whatever being in the just the right color to set the tone. Um, the sound obviously is not as good because Ben Burt is not there. And so it's just people trying to be sci-fi sounds that have a lot of money behind them. Sure. And, you know, the special effects on the force awakens are good because I think they're that fusion of practical and CGI, which is what I had been kind of fighting for since the original trilogy or excuse me, since the prequel trilogy came out that they should just fuse this, you know, have puppeteers, but have the puppeteers wear green suits and have green strings so that you can just block them out. But you still have a tactile object that the actor can react to and you can get this organic performance from. Um, So that's nice. Obviously, Ryan Johnson didn't go that way. He went full prequel of just kind of CGI everything in his film, and it shows, and it doesn't age well. And, you know, The Rise of Skywalker is just a disaster. I don't think that there's even much you can... It's just... It's so incoherent. You can't even judge it on any of one of these <laughs> metrics because none of them have been... have been seem to have been thought out well enough to even be, to even be looked at. Sure. Okay. Uh, jumping out to uh, Spencer. Same question to you. From a filmmaking standpoint, they're all really, really good. They're beautiful. I think we've talked about that nearly ad nauseum now, but they're very, very pretty. I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt. I do have to ask a question. This is for you. Um, and then yeah. in turn to everybody. Um, you guys have all, so far, all three of you have said that. Um, is that because of, and you said the, the director, I'm sorry, was, was Ryan Johnson. Is that correct? On the, on the second one, on yes. On the second one. So it, yeah, was, that because of, was that because of him or was that because the amount of money that they had allocated to them and the advancements in the tech that we well, I think, have to film? Well, I think Last Jedi was particularly striking. Of course, you know, the endless budget machine that is Disney uh, helps. <laughs> doesn't hurt. Sure. But Last Jedi looked and felt different than the other movies, for better or for worse. However, whether regardless of how you feel about the film itself, but it looked radically different. Uh, it had that, uh, like, I forget who mentioned it earlier, just the shots of red and black and the contrast, and that all feels like Ryan Johnson. Like, you can watch yeah. Knives Out. You can watch Knives Out Hell and yeah. get aspects yeah. of that. You're like, oh, this is this is Ryan. So the way I think he frames was... shots and stuff, too, like the, mm-hmm. the angles that he takes. Like, yeah. there's a very, the, that he tries to build tension. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's gorgeous. And so I think Last Jedi, uh, they're all pretty films because of the money that Disney throws at them. Mm-hmm. I think Last Jedi is the most visually pleasing because of what Ryan does with it. I think you can't. For sure. That's unfortunately that's I, I well, I would have to agree with you as far as just other large budget blockbusters and trilogies go franchises. That's not necessarily always the case if you have more money, because you look at a trilogy like The Hobbit, not beautifully done. A lot of lot of shots completely framed just you don't even know what the cinematographer was fucking th- the DP was thinking, you know, um, right. just the, the entire th- time and the entire thing looks like it's in a sepia filter. Right. It, yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah, it does. It really, it, uh, yeah, I was surprised you knew that. Um, but yeah, exactly. It, it completely does. Um, and it's, it's just, it's one of those things. So maybe this is a testament to how talented Ryan Johnson is. And then, and I'm sorry, who directed the, who directed seven and nine? Was that, AJ Abrams. 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 Yeah, okay. so, and I think, yeah, and I think a big part of why the sequels may be overall want to might be the most visually pleasing besides uh-huh. just the, the new age effects and and the dollars uh, to it is they they had the the added benefit of learning of the sins of the past of mixing practical effects with digital and finding the right way to do it. 
Uh, I mean, we, we talked about The Force Awakens being essentially a remake of Episode 4 with elements of right. 5 and 6 sprinkled in. I've always thought of, of uh, The Force Awakens as essentially an apology letter to the people who didn't like the prequels. <laughs> where they were like, okay, yeah, okay. You, you, th- you said the prequels didn't feel like Star Wars. This feels like Star Wars because we've just fucking taken Star Wars and polished it. And we just ripped it off. Enjoy. And one, it was to the detriment. I thought it was to the detriment of the story. Because it For seemed sure. to me that the natural progression after Return of the Jedi would be a return to the prequel era where you essentially have Luke as the head of the Jedi Council, Leia as the charge of the Senate, and you would essentially have sort of the, the trappings and the textures of the prequel era mm-hmm. updated and blockified and, you know, sort of retrograded to look like the 70s era Star Wars and it's pretty clear. I mean, and if you watch interviews with J.J. Abrams, he, he specifically says we wanted to step away from what Star Wars was, i.e. the prequel trilogy. But yeah. it seemed to me that the only coherent progression from Return of the Jedi was a blending of the prequel trilogy and the original trilogy of, again, Luke Skywalker in the Jedi Temple as the head of the Jedi Council in a new Jedi Order and Leia in the Senate with a reform. You know what I mean? Like, that was the logical progression Mm -hmm. because they didn't want to do that and because they didn't want to evoke prequel flashbacks. They said, well, let's just remake A New Hope. Let's just destroy everything and burn it all to the ground, especially with Ryan Johnson. Let's just burn it all to the ground and have no respect for what came before. But... It, it seemed to me that like because they didn't want to touch the prequels, they really – that was one of the first problems with the, with the sequel trilogy was the fact that because they didn't want to touch the prequels, it forced them into this very contrived position where somehow where the Empire is back again and we're now facing a third Death Star – Again, and the galaxy is at fate again. You know what I mean? It was just like this is not necessarily where this should have gone. In all, and, in all of JJ's mystery boxes, yeah, which he obviously, I mean, regardless of whatever treatments he had for the next two films, he clearly didn't know how to set up because I remember being in the theater when Maz Kanata handed Ray the lightsaber and said, "That's a story <laughs> for another time." And I said, "That shit's never going to get paid off, <laughs> or it's going to be paid off in a comic book." How could you? What do you? How do you explain that? We found his severed hand floating in the sky. Like, of course, there's though he didn't know. The point is nostalgia. That's the lightsaber. You remember that? It. uh, Yeah, that's Uh that is the great sin of the Force Awakens. Is way, way, way too heavy handed with nostalgia. And in a lot of ways, I feel like the sequels, they were they were a damned if you do, damned if you don't, because we had this thirty year gap that was filled with the old expanded universe of books, Mm -hmm. uh, which of course got unmade as canon uh and that pissed a lot of people off including me i sank a lot of time into reading and buying those books uh but then you had also kind of had the fan fictions that everybody had written in their heads about the way they thought it would go and there was no way you were going to please everybody so they were you know just sort of fucked from the word go and it seems like they just picked there was no good solution so they just picked a Eh, solution but my th- my opinion on the sequels as a whole is they had the ability with the insanely good cast the money and the the talent they had on their hands these should have been great films and they settled for being fine okay um so really quick i do before we jump on to the next subject i do want to swing this over to gary and neil really quick uh gary uh your thoughts there because you were making some faces when people were <laughs> We're commenting on, on, on Last Jedi. Uh, so uh, cinematic production checklist. Well, yeah, I, I echo the thought that, you know, the uh, the sequels are just, uh, and from a film standpoint, look the best, like far and away. Um, they like, and, and I, I even agree that Ryan Johnson's um, really, it, it feels like when he made um, The Last Jedi, it was around five or six images that he wanted to show on the screen. That he really liked. Yeah. Yep. It, it kind right. of reminded me of like the, the Zack Schneider movies, like 300 or, or Watchmen, uh, Watchmen or, yeah. where it's like, mm-hmm. this is a scene from like the comic book that we want to show. Like, so when you have, um, uh, uh, Laura Dern uh, smash the ship, her ship through the other ships, and you just have like that flash of hyperdrive. That to me is like that's that was a still in Ryan Johnson's mind. And then when you have, Which he said yeah. he said that he said someone from production 
came to him with a shot of the Star Destroyer and said, wouldn't that be cool? And he said, wow, you're right, that would mm. be. Just like he also said that the bombers in the beginning were created because he wanted to mimic that shot from whatever World War II movie it was that right. he did he aped off of mm. of the bombs dropping down and it's like when you look at that sequence none of it makes sense what are these things why are they doing mm. this is post supposed like you could just break that whole scene down and you could see this is the incoherence of the movie but you can see that ryan johnson wanted that shot of the bombs coming down mm. with rose's sister looking because he loved that shot from another movie and that was the priority it wasn't does this make any sense mm. with the story and with the rules of the universe as it's been already established by a lot of people before you. Right, yeah, and like when you had like them on the the salt planet at the end and like there's for whatever reason a bunch of red under the salt like visually very very beautiful and very yeah. interesting doesn't make a lot of sense and going back to kind of the bombers like yep. the one yep. of the yep. and this will I think kind of come in later but like um when we talk about plot and characters but like you have like this really interesting like World War II kind of bombers uh, look and feel going on, and then uh, butted up right next to it, you've got some slapstick <laughs> comedy and your mama jokes, and it's just like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on in this thing? Oh, like Thor Ragnarok. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm trying to copy Guardians of the Galaxy. Sorry, MCU. Another another oh, episode for another works. day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Neil. Neil, uh, we're one run around out here with you. Um, you know, where where are you at on this one? It seems like the the panel's kind of kind of split on this, with the exception of Last Jedi. I mean, as far as the cinematics go, I think it's been touched on and it's been you know beaten to death. I think they are the prettiest of the films, while still looking the dirtiest. Uh, they're not you know pristine as the the prequels were, um, but that's just due to new technology. Uh, bigger budgets, uh, you know, all that stuff we've already covered. I I agree that I think the sound and the scores were lacking in these. Um, no, but John, just overall cinematics, I think they were the most pleasing to watch. Okay. So, and, and now correct me if I'm wrong, John Williams did all nine, is that correct? Yes. Right? Correct. Okay, just making sure. Uh, okay, so I want to go ahead and just, just for the sake of time, because I, I do want to get to... I do want to get to the future of the franchise and problems that they ran into at the very end. I'd like to have mo most time for that. So I'm going to combine characters and plot into one thing. We honestly already discussed a lot of it in part one, I think. I think yeah. you guys really just, you got a lot of your grievances out of the way. I'm sure there's still plenty more, but let's combine. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of push through this one a little bit. I'm as I'm sure there's going to be maybe 2% of people listening to this that have not actually seen the films. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as, as far as what we what we haven't talked about yet, as far as characters and plot go, Neil, I'm going to, we'll, we'll loop back around. I'll start with you. Um, as far as the originals go, we know that we've got, from what Gary said, we've got Luke Skywalker, the main protagonist. We've got Han Solo. We've got Princess Leia. And we've got Darth Vader. Those are, we, could we agree those are probably our four main characters if you had to choose? Yes. Yeah, the first three? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we've got those three. Those uh, you, would you? I would presume you would say those are the creme de la creme. Those are your 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 favorite four. That's what, and they were the first ones. So that was the one. Those were the people that they built the rest of the series off of, and the rest of the scripts. Um, do you think though that the strongest set of characters were in the first three? Do you think the strongest character arcs? Do you think the strongest dialogue and plot writing was in the first three movies? Why or why not? I mean, I think those three characters, those three main characters, are definitely the most iconic, obviously, of the series. Um, they're the first ones you got introduced to. They're the first ones you fell in love with. Um, as far as character growth, I think they, especially Luke, I think grew the, a lot. Um, you know, he's the one that went full light side then got tempted down to the dark side but then came back and managed to bring darth vader back to the light side um you know you have a, a, a love story a kind of a love triangle depending on who you're looking at um <laughs> yeah between... <for> did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh we're all regretting that uh, at the end of empire <laughs> <laughs> but uh as far as that goes i think i think those three core characters are are the strongest in the series uh in general until they get put into the uh, 
sequels, at which point they become terrible characters. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, well, well put, well put. Um, so one thing Gary and I had talked about yesterday was that he had really been frustrated with um, this, the pr- both the prequels and the sequels, especially with Ray and Anakin, that he didn't feel they spent enough time on those two part- those two characters in particular, and those should have been the protagonists of their respective trilogies. Um, and something that we had agreed upon, and anyone's welcome to disagree, I don't think they will, but that the first three had done a very good job with that on on uh, Luke in particular. They had spent a lot of time on not only his enough time on his backstory, but a lot of time on his personal growth throughout the other three. And then once Empire Strikes Back came around, then you started to see more on the ancillary secondary characters. Um, you start you start seeing more growth with Han and with Leia and even with Darth Vader um, and then throw in whoever else you fucking want, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, do yeah, you- I, I mean, yeah, Star Wars A New Hope is definitely the Luke Skywalker story right. and then Empire and Return is the... Rebellion cast. story. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's what very well put. Very well put. Yeah. It became more of an ensemble than just the Luke show for sure. Uh, Gary, Gary to you on that one. Where are you at with that? Um, and just the plot itself. I'm, yeah. I'm so I, going I think the stories as they go on, um, even in the original trilogy, uh, grow a little bit weaker because they, okay. um, they lose focus. Uh, like the first one is really tightly focused on Luke Skywalker and, you know, his hero's journey. Um, and then by the time you get to uh, uh, the Return of the Jedi, um, you've got a whole bunch of different plots that are all running concurrently, um, which kind of steals focus away from what you're trying to say uh, in, in a lot of ways. Um, now, don't get me wrong, I think... Return of the Jedi was a really great movie, but I think you lose a lot of that focus. And then you get to episode one, and you've got, boy howdy, uh, a whole bunch of different endings going on at the same time. You've got, um, you know, uh, the lightsaber duel. You've got uh, the storming of the castle. You've got the... Qui-Gon story. you got the Gungan story. The Gungan battles, yeah. yeah. And it's it's just just a a big mess. So I, I think that... Um, and there are, um, you can go onto YouTube and watch, uh, people's cuts of movies and you can see, uh, like it, you just take all of Anakin's scenes and all of the deleted scenes and splice them together and it gives you about an hour and 40 minute movie. And it's much better because it's much tighter <laughs> on his story and it, 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 it feels a lot better. Um, you, you'd lose like having a trilogy at that point, but I think it overall tightens up the story a lot. Um, there, there are some writers that can do uh, stories with a whole bunch of different things going on, like, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings with uh, J.R.R. Tolkien or um, George R.R. Martins with his uh, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that can all make sense. But for the typical writer, I think that's a really high bar to try and set for yourself. So, like, because A New Hope was just really like somebody in high school English class. So like, we're going to talk about the hero's journey and these are the archetypes, the main archetypes you got to have. You got to have the, the young hero, the wizard, the damsel in distress, the, uh, um, the kind of roguish guy. And, you know, it really <laughs> hits those beats and we as people all recognize that. So I think that's why a new hope feels to me so tight. Sure. Um, also, yeah. here's Kurosawa. You like the Forbidden yeah. Fortress? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. Hidden Fortress. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, and like there's George Lucas, I don't think, um, is shy about expressing how much he uh, was influenced, how much he borrowed, and how much he outright stole from other people that he really liked, which I don't think is a problem. <laughs> um, it's been, they've been doing it since the beginning of yeah. the story time. And, and yeah, it's, it's called influence. Yeah. That's right. And I, I think that's fine. Um, but... Uh, like as as you kind of get away from that as the stories move on, um, I, I, it muddies the water and makes it less crisp. Okay, so for the sake of time and sake of argument, I, I think the general consensus is the strongest characters and the strongest plot mm-hmm. from the original tr- from the trilogies goes to the first one. Like if we had to choose, does anybody disagree with that? Anybody at all disagree with that? No, great. All right, no, uh, I so. Agree. Okay, so so moving moving forward with that, um, so Luke, I want to go to you really quick. As far as the prequels go, where could they have strengthened their case for 
getting on par or getting to the same level that the original three were at as far as character development, just the damn storyline. Um, we won't even go into dialogue because we already talked about it being cheesy as hell. Um, what could they have done? What did they fuck up on? How did they mess it up? What happened? <laughs> oh God, I could, you could do a whole, you could do a whole semester on how to improve. I bet the you could. Trilogy. <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, it, it, you just I, long story short, you got to get a better director who understands pacing and who understands who has a little bit of uh, just had their teeth cut so they would stand up to George uh-huh. and say, hey, you know, I think we need to introduce this idea to the audience in this way or, hey, I you know I don't think that they're going to pick up on this. It's not going to track well, whatever. Sure. But again, I think it comes down to. You know, and, and this is going to sound trite, but I think I probably would get some grim on this is that J.J. Abrams kind of should have directed the prequel trilogy because J.J. Abrams is all flash and no substance mm-hmm. and George Lucas is all substance and no flash. And if they'd work together, you would have had a fine Cobra Kai-esque balance of having the nostalgia and mm-hmm. having the things that you needed to, but also having enough attention focused on the new characters that you don't get bogged down sure. in sort of hero worship. Mm-hmm. And so think i mean the biggest thing is you have to tighten up the script you really have to tighten up the script um but the the overall themes are pretty good again sure. the idea that the democracy gets corrupted by apathy and ignorance and and palpatine is able to use you know his sith powers which appeal to the baser side of humanity you know essentially that's what the dark side is is submitting to our indulgences use that you know i mean that's politics that's rome that's that's athens that's part of i mean that's right. human history so those are those are really interesting themes it would have been really fun to see them but you gotta present it in a way that's interesting you gotta make sure that you don't waste an ounce of screen time <laughs> every line has to be useful every second every frame has long to senate be debates something. <laughs> You know, I mean, and you can have debates, but what are the stakes? Why are they interesting? Why do I care? Right. And, you know, maybe again, don't shoot shot reverse shot. Maybe you start the debates where people are listening to the debates from other parts of the planet or excuse me, other parts of the universe. And you're hearing like, OK, these these are people who are going to be affected by these debates. Maybe there's a spice freighter on Tatooine somewhere who's listening and they're trying to figure out what they're going to do. I mean, there's again, there's a million different ways that you could have done it. You can tell that George Lucas had been doing LucasArts video games throughout all of the late 90s and early 2000s, and that's the way that he was approaching the presentation of that material was just like computer video games. Here's here is an exposition sequence in between this action sequence that we can do. Because I mean, when you we're going to get to it as yeah, well, when you look at like a movie like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, that's yeah. a, a lot of that movie is set um, in the U.S. Senate and it's senators debating. Um, which is akin to a lot of the prequels. Yeah, like thirty percent of it, I guess. Yeah, a, a, a fair portion it's a, it's of it. A good, you're like, right. It's a good. Mind. You know, it's the, minutes, especially yeah. the end of the movie. Um, you know, you, you don't have to have like all these crazy special effects or all of these um, ridiculous things to make a, sc- a story compelling. You know, because yeah, like if you watch, <laughs> yeah, if you watch, Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Like that's a, a really really tense, compelling story. Right. Uh, so Spencer, to you. What characters, uh, so the plot itself too, but what characters do you think in the prequels were just, God, they just, they tried to hit it out of the park and they, you know, three strikes and they're out, just completely fell flat on their face when writing. You know, I mean, obviously Jar Jar Binks, I think for everybody comes to mind. He's a funnier um, character than but, we've ever had before. <laughs> we yeah, have they to needed get him working. Of course. I it, will punish the audience like for not need, liking him. It's like him. needing it, fart jokes in Titanic. He's you know, like, everything. It's the key. <laughs> <laughs> but Spencer, to you, um, where, where, do you think, uh, where do you think the prequels really fell flat on their face with, with trying to uh, stay on par <laughs> with the originals? Uh, the prequels in a lot of ways, and I think the reason why... Uh, sort of people have started to come back around on the prequels is because they're not kind of in a vacuum by themselves anymore because we have the clone wars uh not enough can be said about how dave filoni kind of saved the prequels with the clone wars uh, by actually giving us the character development and the stories that we wanted uh should have been in the movies yeah, exactly. Like the, a lot of this or, you know, the Clone Wars at least shouldn't have had to be the saving grace. They could have been what they were. And you should have also had that happening in the movies. Like there's there's plenty of care, even important characters like Padme Amidala and to a, to an extent, uh, Senator, later Chancellor Palpatine, later mm-hmm. Darth Sidious. 
like in the movies, they're just sort of there. It's a couple lot. There's not a lot of depth to them, but there should be. I mean, you've got it takes a lot of it's it takes a lot of air quotes talent to make Natalie Portman sound like she sucks at reading lines. Sure. And God damn it. George Lucas nailed it. <laughs> um, so she went a Razzie, didn't she? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was. So, yeah, I think it's just, everything was just sort of half fleshed and George had this vision of what he, George needed someone to say no. And I think uh, yeah. <laughs> there, there's a re, uh, one Even of the reasons Gary there is, one of the reasons the original trilogy is so much better than the prequel trilogy is because George only directed one of them. Uh, <laughs> so I, yeah. I think it was it was George Lucas gets to do what George Lucas always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And that's not always the best thing as evidenced by his his endless tinkering on the original trilogy. OK, uh, so, Jacob, same question to you. Uh, where did the where did the prequels fall flat, man? Like, did we not oh. see enough? What's what's going on? What did we not see enough of? What do we need to see more of? Oh, basically everything they already mentioned. Just characterization of like Anakin. Like uh-huh. the entire prequel trilogy hinges on watching Darth Vader become Darth Vader, but there's nothing interesting about him being a child, really. Mm-hmm. Especially especially when you write him to like one of his first lines is like, "Are you an angel?" It's like, oh fuck. We're <laughs> I remember that one? Actually. Um, and then all of his other lines as well, like. Uh, so, like Jake Lloyd's been through a lot. I mean, so has like Hayden Christian, basically anybody who is involved with the prequel trilogy um, has gotten a lot of hate. Um, lots of, but, lots yeah, of drugs. It comes, yeah. Yeah. It comes down to just like the writing and the direction, like all like, yeah, like, uh, like they mentioned, like you have all these top class actors, uh, Natalie Portman, even McGregor, uh, Chris, like Christopher Lee, I think is Lee, on it. Yeah. Like Christopher Lee he's on point. is, he, yeah, he's actually on point. Same with Ian McDermott. Like they know what the fuck they're doing, but everyone else is like taking it super serious, but they're not emoting in any sort of way. And they make this clunky dialogue just sound even worse in comparison to everything else that's happening in the movie. Um, and for how we were talking about how busy the film is, like the, the shot reverse shots, like they're just so boring. Like there's nothing happening in the rooms that like when they're talking, they're literally just standing still. Like, I'll never, like, when I think of uh, just, it's very static. Like, George can throw all the shit in the background that's happening, but everything in the scene is just very static. Uh, like, uh-huh. like when uh, like when R2 gets introduced in episode one, right? The, uh, so what's this droid's name or number? And the guy literally just walks over to R2, and it's like like five seconds, but at five seconds was completely unnecessary. It's just like, he had to fucking read, like, we just wasted time watching him walk to a goddamn droid and, like, call off its name. It was just, like, just a lot of waste, a lot of excess. Right. Um, Indulgence. Yeah, when he should have yeah, just been like, who gives a fuck what the droid's name and, is? And it was, <laughs> yeah, and it was also, it was very telling, like, George Lucas did not care about filmmaking as much as he cared about toys. Like, everything comes down to the marketing of those movies, right? right? It's just like money. toys after toys after toys. And it just felt like George uh, hadn't really seen a movie in a long time, in a lot of, <laughs> in some form or fashion. I don't know what inspired him. Yeah, I don't know what inspired him. It's like, yeah, man, like <laughs> he should have just handed the direction to James Cameron had Aaron Sorkin. Uh, just come in and rewrite it. the entire like, script. <laughs> Like Jesus Christ! That made like, the Senate oh, debates I, a lot more interesting. Only exactly like there's only like a few people who would make the like the Trade Federation, and that's the thing, right? It's called Star Wars, and it's I can understand George wanting to go through, wanting to you know actually bring the war aspect into it. It's not just a bunch right. of like good versus evil. Let's let's try and just, like, watch the fall of de- fall of democracy. There's very it's the prequels feel very Shakespearean of watching the downfall of your hero, right? Right. With Anakin and the rise of evil. But yeah, the prequels just don't pull it off in any way. Okay, so if if we if we move forward with that and we go if we go to the sequels, okay, completely completely different feel, maybe maybe not. I don't know, Gary. I know you've got a lot of strong opinions on this one. Um, where where are you at with the sequels on that one? As far as character goes, yeah, same thing. Character 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 and plot. What did what did they do as well as the original three? Because I think we're obviously that's the one on the highest pedestal that we're comparing it to. So what, well, did, what, or what could they have done to change it up to, to make it better? I, you know, I, I will say this, was the, uh, for the prequels, they were, they were a new idea. Mm-hmm. Like 
they tried something new. Whereas if you look at uh, The Force Awakens, um, it was very much a, a rehashing, a soft reboot of uh, what A New Hope and the original trilogy were. Um, and, you know, when you get to the, the characters like Rey, um, and the thing is, like, it's hard to remember who, who's, what the names of the characters are sometimes. Like, it's a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, they're just... They're not as memorable. Unremarkable. Yeah. Like, you hear Luke Skywalker. And that's that's a name that sticks out in your head. You hear Poe Damarung, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's fine. Um, he was easier to remember than... F- I couldn't remember Finn's name Finn. until the third movie. Finn, yeah. 2187. Yes. Yeah. Like, um, but like does so much more with that. Anyways. So with, uh, with, with Ray or Ree... Uh, Ray, Ray, Mayor uh, Ray Sue, the, Mayor yes. Ray Sue. Yeah, and that I think yeah, I think is a real obvious critique of hers. Like she is very much, um, she doesn't have a lot of challenges to her. She's kind of like Captain Marvel. Like everything <laughs> she does is successful. Like it's the first time she pilots, you know, the Millennium Falcon. She gets a triple kill on the uh, the Tie Fighters. Right. Um, you know, I like this. Yeah, yeah, mm, I like this. Um, and I think that lady is a good actress. I enjoyed her in uh, the Daisy Murder Ridley. on the Orient Express. Uh, yeah, Daisy Duke. No, no Daisy, Ridley. Daisy Ridley. Daisy Ridley. Yeah. Daisy Ridley. Yeah. Not Daisy Duke. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love Jessica uh, Simpson. <laughs> um, you know, and like the first time, like she, you know, she's not even trained in like using the force but she can like undo the like o- overcome the mind effects and i know that's kind of exp- trying semi explained later by her being a palpatine but that to me is not a a very good uh example you know i, I don't he's think- a skywalker not a palpatine didn't you see in the movie oh she's ray skywalker oh that, that and that ending like the the I, I will say that they at least tried to make it, it felt like human beings on the screen a little bit more. Okay. Um, she was a very weak character because she didn't like. I didn't see much of growth or a hero's journey from her. OK. Um, and then was that a problem with was that a problem with the writing of them not doing what they did in the first one? So the same thing we had talked about, they didn't give enough time to build Anakin's story in Phantom Menace. They didn't give enough time to build. Uh, right. Ray story in uh, yeah, Force like, Awakens. Like it, it needed. It should have been her movie they, instead of an ensemble. Cast. Yeah, I mean, they should have been more ancillary characters rather than. Um, so less time on Kylo, less time on Poe. Yeah, less time I mean, on and Finn. You, you could do more. You, you could have Kylo there a lot because uh, yeah. he, he's kind of the foil. His story's to her. pretty important. I'm not, yeah. you know, I mean, or you could you could have him be the focus um, was. because they 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 did not do that well with Anakin in the prequels Mm -hmm. as well as they could have or should have. Um, So I think just the characters were, were weaker than they could have been. Um, And, you know, it, it just, they, they didn't act the, the ones from the original trilogy didn't really act like themselves. Um, The bad guys were incompetent buffoons. Like does any, is anyone worry? It's kind of like the battle droids from uh, the prequels. Like, if you see a thousand battle droids and you know you're like, oh, the Jedi's gonna just cut them down. It's not gonna be a problem. Knife going through hot butter. Yeah. Yeah. Until those droid decas come in, man. That's yeah. true. They got those force fields, baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then like the stormtroopers in the Force Awakens, um, I think they did a, a better job of making them seem more threatening. Um, like with the opening shot where they go and attack the camp. Um, what is that old guy's name? That was. Uh, in seven Max von Sydow. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Point for you. Ding. Um, with Max what? von Sydow, the guy's out. he's got uh, a piece of the map for Luke. Right. Um, like they seemed Im- imposing and like trouble. Um, but then you get to um, uh, the Last it's Jedi. It, well, you get to uh, well, Finn's kind of a separate. Thing, but like you get to the Last Jedi and the stormtroopers are just all idiots. The Empire is a bunch of idiots. They're running ships into each other and like. Not shooting at the base on the ground, like they're shooting at the base on the ground when they should be shooting at the ships that are about to jump to light speed. I mean, it's just a, a bunch of stupid stuff that they do. Yeah. And to that point, the Eric Trump character 
who in the Force Awakens was at least competent, maybe a little bit psychotic. Mm-hmm. You know, this would be the right. He's he's a fucking buffoon in the Last Jedi to the mm-hmm. point where within the first ten minutes of the movie, you're like, okay, I'm not. This is not a threat, and there yeah. are no stakes with him because I, he's obviously an idiot. I feel bad for that actor because, like, I think I see where he was trying to go in the Force Awakens, like it's Domino Gleason, I think, right? Domino uh, Gleason, yeah, yeah. Like he, he was trying to make like this one, like you know. And then, like, in Last Jedi, it just totally got ruined. And so uh, when J.J. Abrams took the helm over again, he's like, I got to kill you off unceremoniously. Yeah, there's nothing left. Yep. There's nothing <laughs> left. Yeah. Uh, so, it's so, okay. Yeah, so, so Luke, going to you, agreeing with everything Gary pointed out or with anything you want to add, like, where they could have improved upon? In the sequel trilogy, as yeah. far as the characters and, and Character, stuff, yeah, the characters, the characters in the plot compared to the first. I one mean, arc. they could have respected the original characters. I think that would be the you know respect what it is that, that built this franchise. Maybe watch <laughs> the you, original can trilogy. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean? Yeah, maybe watch Star Wars once. <laughs> you know, just just saying. You know. Okay. How were they disrespectful? Um, and you for, know, for those that aren't familiar. But with I mean, there's just I mean, there's so much. What do you say that has been said about you know a million times about the last jedi and the sequel trilogy it's just you know it's all there but um i think that you know i i, I know we talked about this on the last podcast and i don't want to sound like a broken record but i'm going to say it because it's true say it some people haven't look heard at cobra it, so. kai mm-hmm. look at the way that cobra kai respects the old characters brings in new characters and allows for a handing of the torch and the sequel trilogy did not do that. And and the original, I mean, remember, J.J. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan weren't the first writers on The Force Awakens. There were other writers who have come out subsequently and said they wanted to bring in Luke earlier. But specifically, the word was Lucasfilm, a.k.a. Kathleen Kennedy, didn't want Luke to come in because he would suck all the attention out of the room away from the new characters that they were trying to promote. So... It was a very conscious, deliberate decision on the part of Lucasfilm and Disney to say, we're going to tear down these old characters so that we can make our new characters look cool. Right. And they were thinking, well, this is the way we're going to do it. I mean, and this has also been, you know, this was in Deadline. They said the reason that Star Wars land at Disney doesn't have Tatooine, doesn't have Moss Eisley, doesn't have Hoth, doesn't have any of the classical Star Wars stuff was because Kathleen Kennedy went to Bob Iger and said, quote, do we want to make Star Wars land for all those 50 somethings who are going to be dead? Or do we want to make Star Wars land for the new Disney Star Wars? And so their idea from the beginning was bury that old shit. We don't need it. Let's draw the audience's attention to these new characters because we own these and these are Disney Star Wars. And from what I understand, Johnny, we both worked in licensing. So you'll probably appreciate this. I sure. understand that part of the agreement with Lucasfilm with Disney owning Lucasfilm is that George Lucas still owns the IP for any of his characters. Right. So residuals are owed to him if there's Regardless. Star Wars land or if they're used in the movies and stuff oh, like I that. Did, I did not so know I think that, that also has part of the reason to do with it is they don't want to embrace those characters because it's just money out the door that they don't want to deal with. But their priority wasn't let's just drown out the old and bring in the new. Then you could have had Cobra Kai level success where everybody loved it. The people who love, and you see this with the Mandalorian, look at the way that people reacted to the last episode of the Mandalorian versus the way people reacted to the last Jedi. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's right there. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's something that Hollywood has always done with big budget, especially big budget producers is they're always trying to make that quick buck right then and there. They don't really seem to care about, creating the story that's going to last for generations, which the original three did. Um, so yeah, no, super valid point. Uh, Jacob, to you, same question. Um, you know, where, where did the, where did the, uh, sequels go with the plot and the characters that you liked that they improved upon or what got worse? What could they have done to have made it better? Where are you at with that? Oh, I think they had like an amazing setup. They just like okay. dropped the ball completely. Um, How so? like I, I love, I love the setup of Finn as a child soldier as a child soldier within the First Order. I like the Good idea facts. of yeah, and like Captain Phasma, like being like I thought Captain Phasma would be like a bigger character, but she just became the Boba Fett of this trilogy. Right. Um, uh, like even Ray's background, like she's basically been abandoned on this planet. She's had to like overcome all these obstacles on her own, and she's like badass with this staff. And it's like okay, this seems cool. Let's see where we could go with this. And then she has this mysterious past and 
Uh, she's linked to Luke's lightsaber that just popped out of fucking nowhere. Um, well, that's a story there, for another time. So. Was there a hand attack? Well, it's probably going to lead back to Luke, you know, his clone from uh, the expanded universe. Um, but, uh, and even like Poe Dameron as this like hotshot pilot, it's like, I think they had like all these, like in the cast, like they have great charisma with one another, right? Something the prequels didn't have. It just felt like everyone there just kind of hated each other or just didn't get along. Um, but like anytime the three of them were on screen, Finn, Ray and Poe, it was just magic. And then like Kylo Ren, just like. Adam Driver's performance is like the best part of those movies. They're easily yeah. the best character of those films, sure. right? He goes through like a full on arc and he's basically Anakin realized in a lot of ways outside of like the Clone Wars. Like he is what Anakin should have been in the uh, original trilogy or the the prequel trilogy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's just right. like this petty child who just, just has mommy and daddy issues. And it's like watching him fall to the dark side and then come back to the light. It's like, okay, that's pretty cool. And then, uh, but yeah, it fails because I love what they do with Rey in The Last Jedi. I love that they sure. just drop the whole who is she thing. Like, she's a nobody. It's like, that's that's perfect. That's how I wanted it. I wanted it to be like, what if she was just like something that was abandoned on the on the side of the street, right? Her parents just didn't want her because that happens. That's, she's a that's, Palpatine. That's life. <laughs> she's but instead, yeah, she's a fucking we don't know Palpatine. That yet. She's special. <laughs> we don't know that yet. It's like... Why does everyone in this universe have to be special? Why does everyone well, have to have a goddamn destiny? Why can't people just be like people? Like, yes, she's strong in the force. You could, aspect. yeah, you could do some sort of like she's just Anakin reconstituted type stuff. But I like that she was just abandoned, you know, and she's had to work her life, like work her way through life yeah. to get where she is. Very much like us millennials, right? Because uh, <laughs> we can't rely on the older generation. But yes, the um, and like I know I'll probably might be alone in this but i do love the characterization of luke in last jedi uh um, oh, well you're yes, mistaken you are. yes <laughs> yeah uh but that's coming you've from seen star wars <laughs> yeah but that's more personally i like watching my heroes fail you know i why? uh why because I, I like i like immersing myself in that world in that way right i like seeing how my, are they my... hero if they fail because you watch him give, go through it and break out of it, right? By the end of it, he has reclaimed who he was. He no, realized he, he was he, wrong. He, he gives up and he dies. He doesn't give up and he dies. After he served his saving, purpose. After saving the entire remainder of the oh, resistance. But he could have no. flown there in person. That look, why was I, he even look. giving up in the first place? What is he doing? On, why Luke would never have given up to begin with. Doesn't matter. We're getting off. But we don't know that, right? Time changes people. Like... Come on, <laughs> like it's been thirty years. They could, like what what they're gonna do with the Mandalorian. They're more than likely gonna explain that away, which you know that's what they're. Gonna they do. have to because it's they. There's literally no other way that it works other than for Dave Filoni and John Favreau to come in and trying to ret desperately try and retcon it in a way well, that makes alert. some kind of sense. It's more like that's what's gonna happen. But it, but, but it, that's but even then that doesn't mean it's gonna work. So what he did it for Grogu that doesn't make any sense might as well eliminate the entire like his whole character arc from the original trilogy is completely negated it's not like, there's no point in the original trilogy if luke just turns into this ryan johnson cynical asshole and the idea that ryan johnson's own words were well luke realized that the best thing for him to do was to leave the galaxy so what? So Luke realizes that he's made no positive are you out of your fucking mind? Have you seen Again, have you seen Star Wars? I have. You know what you're talking about? Not you. I'm talking to the person who would say <laughs> to Ryan Johnson. Luke's, the idea that Luke would look at what his life was and say, the best thing that I could do is step out. Again, the only people who could say that would be people who've literally never seen Star Wars because that's that's absurd. It's absurd. See, I like that because I've seen people I, like, I don't succeed. Care if you like it, it does. It's not consistent okay. Well, let, with the let, let him finish his thought on it, Luke, before you interrupt. <laughs> but that's what I like about it. It's well, it's not. It's not that it's not consistent with the character, right? Like Luke does. Like he fails in the Empire Strikes Back. He fails, and his then work. he learns and, and he the learns Jedi and he grows. And, right. So why would he do that again? We don't. Well, and, and it's not explained, last Jedi. So therefore, last Jedi. He made a mistake, right? Like he that almost mistake, came close to killing his own. Why would he do that? His, his why would nephew? he try to kill his own nephew? That's abs that would be like if Obi Wan tried to kill Luke because Luke might go to the dark side. That would never happen. 
You don't know nothing in Obi. Yes, you do because especially if you know one's character, and we know that he would never do that. If it meant the saving of billions, like if you knew that. Oh, there's you might do that. Luke Skywalker wouldn't. Well, after, after that's third. the point I'm trying to make. I understand you like it, but yeah. the character is not consistent. Okay, well, I, I think we've painted a pretty picture here. So, Spencer, I want to go to you because it sounded like you were going to bring something up and I was going to jump to you next anyway. So, please. Well, the sequels are, I think, like we've all kind of talked about story wise, they're super disjointed uh, and they're kind of all over the place. I, I like a lot of the points that Jacob brought up is uh, I think a lot of we get caught up in what would or wouldn't uh, Luke or Han or Leia do. But there has been a 30 year gap. And as we've seen from the universe that we're introduced to in The Force Awakens, nothing has gone how they thought it would go. You know, this rebuilding of the galaxy has stumbled and fallen and fallen flat on its fucking face. And maybe a Luke Skywalker who has looked into the face of his father and seen what the dark side is capable of doing would, in a moment of panic, consider striking down a student and trying to say stop that process from repeating itself. Uh, a, a lifetime of challenges and failures can impact people in different ways. And in the end, he did come back around uh, and, and make it right before he died because that was... It, I know everybody, there are the people who, th- who look at it as, uh, he gave up after the Force production and died, or he expended the last bit of his Force energy doing one of the purest acts of what a Jedi is. He found literally a non-violent way to save all of his friends from certain doom by Force projecting and using the last bit of life that he had in him to give him a shot. Yeah, if inspiring sh- hope in the galaxy. If he'd have showed up in person, Kylo would have mopped the goddamn floor with him. But this was a way that he could even the playing field. Uh, I love Kylo as a character. Really, one of the biggest things that bugs me about the sequels is the wasted cast. Like, the names on that list Mm -hmm. are fantastic. Daisy Ridley is great. Gwendolyn Christie's awesome. Boyega, uh, Oscar, Oscar Isaac, Isaac, Laura Dern, uh, yeah. Adam Driver. You found Driver. a f- way to waste a beautiful performance from Adam Driver as Kylo Ren, who, for my money, is the. I, someone mentioned loving his lightsaber earlier. I love. <laughs> I love the way he ignites his lightsaber more than I yeah. love his lightsaber. He turns that thing on like he's loading a shotgun. It's friggin' awesome. Uh, and just this this raw anger. And I, I also really like the idea that Gary floated that I think it would have been a lot better and it would have spoke to the whole idea of these nine films as a Skywalker saga had you focused on Kylo and Ray had been this Ray from nowhere who is the embodiment of the Force opening itself back up to the galaxy at large and leaving just this singular family. It doesn't have to be about the Skywalkers. It doesn't have to just be about the Palpatines. There were thousands of Jedi from thousands of family lines, and now all of a sudden it has to be a Skywalker? Why? Uh, And I think they also got panicked of... They sort of had the problem of having two big threes to deal with. You know, what do we do with Han, Luke, and Leia as we try to elevate uh our new trilogy and and they just fucked it up they they botched it in a lot of ways but uh yeah it's it's sort of just uh missed opportunities well they did botch it you acknowledge that they did botch it I think I think it's disjointed. It doesn't make sense as a trilogy. Uh, I don't think it's the Last Jedi's fault that it doesn't make sense as a trilogy. Oh, I don't uh, think it is either. But the Last Jedi was the final. Like it's Kathleen Kennedy's fault that it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's obviously the production and the people who are making this. Like that's nobody's going to argue with that. Right. But where do you go after the Last Jedi? Well, after The Last Jedi, it falls on the third film to find a way to finish the arc as it has been set up. And, I, and I've walked through this with some other people before and, and feel free to shoot holes in it. But so we know from Rogue One and Solo that if if Lucasfilm slash Disney is unhappy with the film, they will do massive reshoots. They will delay the opening uh, and in one case, they will bring in a brand new director and reshoot most <laughs> of the movie, which yeah, yeah, which tells 
which tells me that if they weren't happy with The Last Jedi as it was when they released it, they wouldn't have released it that Right, way. I think they were happy. I think that was the reaction. Exactly. I don't, and think, I think, people, I don't think Bob they Iger or... Right, but they did, and because I don't think Bob Iger or Kathleen Kennedy understand Star Wars. So Bob Iger saw The Last Jedi, and he said, whatever, it's got Luke Skywalker, that's great, they'll love that. It comes out. Last Jedi has the biggest weekend, first weekend to second weekend drop ever in the history of any Star Wars movie. Seventy percent, sixty-seven point five percent. I mean, that's huge. Weekend one to weekend two. That tells you fans didn't like it because they're not going back and watching it three or four times like they did with The Force Awakens. He then starts to realize, ooh, okay, we might have a problem here. But again, Bob Iger has said in the interview that he gave to, uh, I believe it was either J.J. Abrams or John Favreau, I think it was J.J. Abrams, he said, I never really liked Star Wars. I was an adult when it came out. I saw it in the theaters. It was interesting because on a special effects side, but it never really clicked with me. So I think they didn't understand all of a sudden, Last Jedi comes out. They start freaking out because people are pissed off online. So they say, and this was released also in a leak, that it was it was Horn and Iger that wanted Palpatine come back. J.J. Abrams did not want that. But they were desperate, and they said, what are the fans going to like? The fans love Palpatine. Let's throw Palpatine in there. Now, I don't know anybody who liked, who didn't like what happened in Last Jedi, who looks at what happened with Luke's character and looks at all the destroy the past, kill it after you have to, all that stuff, who likes what happened in The Rise of Skywalker. Everybody I know who hates The Last Jedi, including me, hates The Rise of Skywalker for the exact same reason, which is that it's clear that these people do not understand the IP that they're dealing with. I will see, say... I like, I loved The Last Jedi and didn't like The Rise of Skywalker because... Right, but the argument is always people that, well, Disney overcorrected because the neckbeards didn't like The Last Jedi and they made Rise of Skywalker. no. The people who didn't like Last Jedi didn't like Rise of Skywalker either. Nobody liked Rise of Skywalker. Uh, absolutely, no. And right. I think they absolutely botched, for sure, the landing of the trilogy. Uh, and there, that's, to me, I kind of looked at that as, it was almost J.J. being petty. He's like, oh, Ryan's not going to stick to my outline, so I'm going to turn around and etch a sketch Ryan's movie out of this. And it created this disjointed mess where you had none I think of that starts from Ryan like Ryan went off on his own did his own thing and the I mean and like what we understand was that Kathleen Kennedy wanted Ryan Johnson to do 3 that's why Colin was pushed out because he didn't like what happened with 2 well, not two with eight, but he didn't like what happened with part two of the trilogy because if you've read what was leaked for Duel of Fates, which was Colin Trevorrow's script, it mm -hmm. was a very different take on Leia and was a very different take on Luke, and he didn't kind of know where to go with it, and Kathleen Kennedy finally said, you know what, you're out. So I think that the reason that it's disjointed is because they, the most important act of a trilogy, which is the second one, was basically done by the seat of their pants, and then when Carrie Fisher died, and then when Ryan Johnson was not brought back for the third one, when Bob Iger requested that J.J. Abrams be brought back for the third one, they basically scrambled and said, we got to do anything we can. And that's why it's such a disaster. But it wasn't, you know what I mean? It was, they, 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 they threw away that plan. And that's kind of where this all went from, went awry was they did. They weren't like Kevin Feige, where they said, we're going to we're going to set these seats up. Kathleen Kennedy said, hey, I like Ryan Johnson's treatment better. This is what we're going to do. And I'm going to make it work. And obviously, I mean, it, it didn't. I mean, if it weren't for the Mandalorian, Star Wars would be effectively dead. I mean, it's interesting so. to think that they spent, you know, four and a half billion dollars on this property, um, Star Wars. Like you think you'd sit down and be like, OK, I'm going to get some good writers and we're going to knock out all three stories, you know, before we start filming on day one. It's hard to say one that it's thing. it's really hard to say that, though, because you, you look at think. a guy you look at a guy like J.J. Abrams and I know yeah. everybody they rag on him because a lot of people that are true Star Trek fans hated the newest three. They hated these other two. And I don't know who else was on his writing team. But you guys have to remember, this guy rose to prominence uh, with Lost. Kurtzman. A lot of a lot of yeah, people. Kurtzman at Hooves okay. ruining but, Discovery. But, you, but it's it's, yeah. it's easy to say, let's get a bunch of let's get a bunch of great writing. Maybe these guys weren't super, super fans of the film. Maybe they just weren't the best writers for the time. I mean, like. 
Like there's there's a JJ lot of JJ was ifs. JJ okay. said that he was a super Star Wars fan, and his whole mm-hmm. thing, like when he was doing press for Star Trek 08, was I tried to make Star Trek more like Star Wars because I was always a Star Wars fan, right? And so that was the sensibility that I brought to this one. But I, mean, I mean, I think I think it's JJ was fine. I think it was it was again it was Iger and Kennedy. It was the people who were really making the decisions didn't understand what they were dealing with. But but it seems like you would want to have a because you know you're going to make a trilogy. Okay. You know, there, there's not a chance that you're not going to make a trilogy. So just sit down and you know write a trilogy so it's paced well. It it makes sense. It's cohesive. And I think doing some more pre-production work before you, yeah. you you have one inch of film ran is going to, you know, would have really made a big difference. I think what, to Luke's point, what he was saying earlier, and this actually is a really good segue into our final topic of the night, um, is the fact that the people who were overseeing this whole production value, you said, uh, mm. you said Kathleen Kennedy yeah. and the whole, the Bob Disney, Iger, yeah. yeah, the Disney crew, whatever. And they're only focused on the money and stuff. You see with trilogies that do really well, when they have those people in the top posi- powers of position that know about the know about that audience and they they want to stay true to the story itself and you know blockbusters like that in the past Lord of the Rings Matrix there's a bunch whatever yeah, yeah. Um, anytime Peter Jackson's a great example of perfect that, of Ex- someone who yeah, really tried exactly. to stay loyal to the and they didn't and at the time it's unfortunate maybe J.J. J. Abrams maybe he would have done a lot better if 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 these uh, Bob Iger and Kathleen Kennedy were not the producers in charge mm-hmm. of Disney and the entire project, maybe if somebody else was in charge, but that's a, what if, you know, that's right. You know, that's because for- Kathleen Kennedy is an excellent producer. Like she's done like a lot of George Lucas movies, like Indiana Jones. I don't know, it's easy to be okay. a good producer when you've just been attached to Spielberg. And sure. Yeah. Films yeah. Yeah. If you're Spielberg writing someone's like the greatest director <laughs> for sure. Like, I mean, Anybody could have been anybody who's Steven Spielberg's producer is probably going to be a good producer. Like, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Maybe they had done. I guess my point is maybe they had done a lot of pre-production work. Maybe mm. the original scripts we may never see them. For all right. we fucking know. I mean, do you, you guys, you've you've read inter, you've seen interviews, you've read blogs and stuff. There are anywhere from fifty to potentially two thousand rewrites of any fucking project before it's even greenlit to start getting budgeting. And this is this. I'm talking like this is a fifty million dollar project, let alone something of star wars magnitude mm-hmm. so yeah, we have no idea what jj yeah. we have no idea what jj wrote at the beginning we we may never know honestly it could be in the trash by all yeah they could have deleted it. who knows um yeah but but uh, sure. kathleen kennedy could have gone next door to marvel and realized that they've got an entire universe of stories right intertwined together she mm-hmm. couldn't really get these three to connect I, it just doesn't make sense but why I would, think why, they why would... thought that they could do whatever i think they thought especially <laughs> after force awakens that star wars fans would just take anything and Gary, you know this, Star Trek fans and Star Wars fans, one group is much more discerning than the other. Yes. You know, and, yeah. you know, I love them both, but I do think that I could, I could see, especially after the success of The Force Awakens, of them saying, we can just do whatever, and it won't really matter because mm-hmm. they'll just eat it up. Yeah. Uh, Neil, why would Marvel help out Lucasfilm? I mean, they're not owned by the same company. or Oh, oh. That, that's true. I mean, oh. it's not like it's one giant conglomerate. Oh, God. Disney owns everything. <laughs> This podcast is brought to you by the Disney Corporation. I would love that. This broadcast is brought to you by Speedstick. Um, No, so where? So last portion of the night here, um, and we're we're going to go over. It's fine. Um, Where where do we go? I you know we'll have a completely separate episode with the Mandalorian and the Clone Wars, and we'll talk about the other movies. We'll just stick with this tonight. Where where do where do they go now from here? Neil, I we didn't get to get get to you because we had such spirited debate in the last topic, but I do want to get to you to start out on this one. Where does the franchise go from here outside of the Mandalorian? What's what's the next step? What do you think they're going to do? What should they do? Should they go back to the basics? Start something brand new? What do you think? Well, I mean, it's Disney, so everything's going to be a money grab. So they're going to go back and try to give us stories leading up to what we already know. Um, They're going to try to work in stories um, in between the films. Like, uh, I mean, obviously, like Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels are great segues between movies. I think they're going to try to work in in more backstories for, for lesser characters like they've already done or... So they're going to do something for Lando, um, things like that. But to me, honestly, if they want to continue any kind of timeline, they need to just 
start from scratch. Like okay. um, these Luke Skywalker era is is over. If you want to continue the Star Wars, it needs to just starting after Rise of Skywalker or starting way before, just create a new storyline, yeah. new characters. Pick pick some type of time, uh, Spencer. I want to jump. I want to jump to you because I know you and I had initially one of the reasons I wanted you to get on this podcast was um, one of the biggest one of your biggest pet peeves was how um, Disney was handling uh, the entire new series and you how worried you were about where they're going next. So, um, what do you think? Oh, I'm just. Uh, we've seen from their their press recently that it's basically almost solely focused on. Uh, TV through Disney Plus uh, over the next couple years at least. Obi Wan, uh, that mini series is going to drop in twenty one. Uh, I, as I understand it, shortly before the third season of Mando, uh, there was the announcement of the Book of Boba Fett, which is going to be a series about Boba. There's going to be a Lando series. Uh, there's essentially going to be another season of Clone Wars with a an animated series looking just at the Bad Batch, who was featured in the final season of Clone Wars. Uh, and there's a couple of the projects that I think I'm forgetting, uh, but they've, they've already said there's a ton coming and it's all mostly all focused on Disney plus and being in a, a TV type format, uh, which so far has been working. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as far as on the film side, we know that Taika Waititi has been brought on to direct and write a star Wars project. Hmm. Uh, so there's at least one movie coming from Taika. We don't really have any other details about that as yet, as I understand. Uh, and then also that Patty Jenkins uh, is going to be doing Rogue Squadron, which will be a one-off movie. Essentially, Star Wars does Top Gun, which, okay, <laughs> uh, boil it in a spoon and shoot it into my veins. I'm here for it. Uh, I mean, obviously, I obviously. <laughs> Like I'll, I'll, I, I will sign up for that. So, so we know they've got all that. I will be really interested in seeing beyond w- what Taika and Patty do with their movies. Um, what, when is Star Wars going to jump back in fil- into film, uh, especially in the uh, trilogy format, which it's most well known for. Uh, and I think they're laying the groundwork right now for that with the. Uh, you know, sort of combined book and comic book uh, launching of the High Republic era. I highly suspect that the next films will be based either in that era or, fingers crossed, baby, the Old Republic era, uh, which would take place even before the High Republic. Uh, I know that myself in particular and lots of fans are clamoring for uh, Old Republic stories, uh, stories about Revan and... uh, that's good. Now, That's what we need. We need them to ruin through. Darth Revan too. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also think that uh, the biggest thing that I think uh, is what's next is that I think uh, John mm-hmm. Favreau is Dave. Dave Filoni is working very close with John Favreau throughout the Mandalorian, uh, and if there is a God in heaven, Dave Filoni will step into Kathleen Kennedy's spot uh, in, in the coming few years. Uh, I think they're just really grooming Dave because Dave gets it. The mm-hmm. Clone Wars is, is hand since the ori- other than the original tr- trilogy, the Clone Wars is the best Star Wars content that exists, uh, at least for my money. Uh, so I really see I really think they're grooming uh, Mr. Filoni to step in. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, I have nothing but uh, excitement for what's to come. Perfect. Uh, Jacob, how about you? I mean, same with everyone so far. Uh, I kind of like more stories distant to the Jedi and the Sith. Just like I kind of want something that doesn't involve the Force at all. Like that's what I was hoping more out of uh, Mandalorian. Like I just kind of wanted something that was just you know grounded back to basics type stuff. Because uh, there's an entire galaxy out there, and I would love an entire cast of actual aliens. Like. I want more aliens in my Star Wars. Like, I want, like, an alien main character. Like, I don't... I'm, t- I'm getting kind of tired of humans. Like, I remember with WALL-E, I was excited because I was like, oh, this is R2-D2, the movie. Yeah. And then they fucking threw in humans and everyone started talking. It couldn't just be line. a silent movie. <laughs> like, I just kind of want... I kind of want them to be more daring with it, like they're doing now with Mandalorian and all the new shows that they're, they're setting up, Rogue Squadron with Patty Jenkins. It's like, okay, this is... This is awesome. This is interesting. You're not just staying on course in one aspect. You're going in all these different directions. But let's go a little further. Um, yeah. I would also love more games. Like, I really enjoyed Jedi Fallen Order. Yes. 
it's get it's get it gave me some uh, good Dark Souls vibes. No, but uh, people I, aren't interested in single player games anymore. It's all they want <laughs> is is microtransaction driven MMOs. Haven't you read the memo from EA? Oh yeah, that too. Uh, yeah, God, EA. Uh, but not as bad as Cyberpunk right now. Um, hey, you know, at least at least they're giving refunds. Not yet. <laughs> I asked for mine three weeks ago, and I still haven't gotten it. Um. And that's on PlayStation, by the way. And I could have bought it on PC, but, but I just wanted it on my nice 4K TV. That aside. That aside. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, more more video games I would love more than anything else, probably. Uh, like, m- movies would be great, but mm-hmm. I would like some more games. I think Battlefront 2 right now is in a great spot. It started off really shitty, uh, but that game has come a long way. Jedi Fallen Order is yeah. really great. Uh, add a lot more myth, like a lot more mythology to the uh, dark times, uh, and I kind of want to see where that cast of characters go. And the combat's really fun. Um, and then, oh God, like I've never, I like the Clone Wars writing. I never liked the animation. Just give me Tartakovsky Clone Wars. Like if you did an entire new Tartakovsky show uh, in Star Wars again, like Samurai Jack style, Ooh. like give me that. Okay. So, so I, I, one 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 thing real quick, because I would hate myself if I yeah. don't mention it, because I love the character so much. And he was such a great surprise in Rebels and got a great name drop in Mando. I cannot wait to see what they do with Thrawn. Oh, yeah. Oh, Robert baby. Downey, man. Did you see that? Robert really? Downey is they're looking at. Uh, I, know that name. I, <laughs> oh. I would much rather it be. Uh, <laughs> I'd much rather it be Mr. Mickelson who voices him in Rebels. Question, question for y'all. Ah, uh, Mads, w- Mads Mickelson? Uh, no, it's not Mads. It's his brother. Uh, I'm gonna have to do uh, but his brother voices him in Rebels. And yeah, I've seen you, him on Rebel. I didn't know that they yeah. were. Okay, interesting. If you, pull, if you pull a picture of him and imagine him as blue, he's Thrawn. Spot on. Remember, it, it, you don't I, know what his name is? Uh, I, can, I, I can pull it. I'm just looking it up now. Anyways, Jacob, you said Thrawn, you had a question man, for that's everyone? a tough one. You got to be a good, you know what I mean. It takes a certain yeah. kind of performance. Yeah, and he he's nailed the voice. I think the voice is perfect, and he's done. Uh, the actor's done some live action stuff. He did some stuff in Game of Thrones. Uh, Lars Mikkelsen is that him? Uh, Lars, yeah, and he also uh, is in The Witcher. Uh, he he has okay. a role in that. So I think no. he would be a great shout for Thrawn. But I'm just really I love that character, and I'm really excited. Oh boy, look at him! Yeah, he'd be great. Uh, quick question for y'all. Ryan Johnson's no longer doing that Knights for the Old Republic trilogy, right? Ha! Uh, they have not officially said that Ryan's... A, they never said it was going to be Knights of the Old Republic. Oh, that was right. Just, we all just speculated. We all just when, hoped. It was back uh, when Benioff and Weiss were doing yeah. their old pre-trilogy. Yeah. That is obviously uh, not happening yeah. anymore. Yeah, they basically Ryan's trilogy is essentially just in limbo. They've they haven't said if it's still happening. They also said that it's not happening. Personally, I feel like no matter how you felt about Last Jedi, especially if you consider the greatest sin of the movie, his treatment of the characters that were established, I would love to see what that man can do with a blank slate Star Wars trilogy. Right. Put it like super far in the future. Yeah, just completely detach it from the known Star Wars uh, timeline because you literally have a galaxy and a nigh endless timeline to play with. Let him go out and play. Yeah, that's why I'm kind of getting tired of the whole prequel and going back in time past trilogies. It's like, can we just go like super far in the future? Yeah. Just give me like futuristic Star Wars, like just weird, just out of bonkers Star Wars. So a not long know, time what ago. Is, what, is, what is there to? <laughs> I mean, just see how like I mean, it's the same thing with a uh, like going back to Knights of the Republic and stuff. It's just like okay, we have the Knight, we have the Jedi, and then we have the Sith. But like, what could what could the universe be in like two hundred years from where it is now? Like, that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. It's like like would it be like Star Wars Legacy, the comic book, where you have like Luke's great 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 grandson, and he's just a fucking meth addict? And he taps in the dark side every, every now and then type stuff. Did y'all ever read that comic? I never cool. read it, but I know about that storyline. Yeah. I don't know. And then, I don't, Luke Skywalker and then, having kids seems to me a complete misunderstanding of Luke Skywalker character. Yeah. And then mm. uh, what was and then in the books and stuff? I can't remember. What's the, the race that's in the outer realms? The that come, Yeah, that they come in and destroy like all the fucking planets. Yeah, they're not canon anymore, so... Yeah, but I mean, how much... 
are they but like, lucas they're, yeah. take, they're taking from the original like not like from the original expanded universe they're bringing a lot of that stuff back neil yeah, i wouldn't be surprised neil are you very bitter that they got rid of all that canon that you spent all no, those years no, reading no. okay no. okay i just no. want to make sure okay thank you I mean the stuff that we reread to keep ourselves sane in afghanistan nope, yeah. not at all, yeah, not the, good all those series uh, of books yeah no <laughs> I mean, again, that goes back to the licensing thing. Like, I can see why Disney did that because they, it if had to they be make it canon, they, yeah. if they make it canon, then they have to pay every writer every time that they use. If they say none of this is true and we're just going to make our own stuff and then they basically just ape off of it with Pablo Hidalgo and don't give him credit, that's all 100% revenue that they can keep as opposed to having to split it with the original writers. So, like, I, I understand the frustration, but I also see like if I was in charge of Disney, that's the first thing I would have done. Would have been fuck all that. None of you get anything. Hundred <laughs> percent. It, it it was painful, but it had to happen because even there were contradictions even within the books. Even within the, the canon, yeah. yeah. Even within that, it, the there canon, were things that didn't make sense. The canon was a a hot mess, and you kind of just had to yeah. do the etch a sketch because. That you said. So much of it was written in the late 90s before the prequels came out and established what pre-Empire era was really like. Yeah. And like I remember reading some of it at the time. They were talking about pre-Empire and what Anakin was like and all this. And then they would talk about how Jedi would have multiple apprentices and how the Sith would have multiple – and all this stuff that like – you know, it wasn't wrong at the time because none of – nothing had been established yet. So they were just going off of you know the best that they could. But then the prequels come in. All these sort of new rules for the universe are set. And it's like, okay, well, we can't, you know what I mean? This is basically relegated to the dustbin anyway. The last thing we're going to do is try and fight over royalties with these B-grade sci-fi writers. Great, guys. Well, unfortunately, we are pretty much out of time for tonight. Um, so this very, very informative, deep, lively debate that we had going on. Really appreciate everybody jumping on with us. Um, we will probably have to end up doing We'll see how yeah. the uh, how this, this episode is received um, out of the other podcasts I've done in the past just – critiquing star wars movies when they when star wars movies when they came out um our viewership like tripled within mm -hmm. that one week um so we'll see we might be able to do a second episode here on specifically gaming the mandalorian um the spin off the one-off movies and uh and clone wars that would be a lot of fun uh before we go though uh every week we do let our guests uh, and our panel uh, go ahead and give a recommendation for our listeners to go ahead and check out that week. Um, I want to stay away from... Originally, I was going to say, okay, pick a Star Wars movie and then tell people to watch that one. Uh, but since we've been talking that to death... Oh, that's what I was going to do. Um, <laughs> well, we've been kind of talking it to death. I think people are just going to go back and watch all of them at this point. I would like everybody to give a science fiction movie, doesn't matter what it is, um, just any sci-fi film, uh, pre preferably one that does involve space, um, as your recommendation for the week. Um, I will go ahead and go first to give everybody else ample time to either look it up online or search through their database of memory. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with, <laughs> I'll go with the first Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm a gigantic MCU fan, um, and it's just Good old fashioned family fun. <laughs> um, yeah. um, it's it's just I had never really known anything about that series. I didn't read any of the comics uh, for Guardians at all growing up, so it was it was cool, you know. And it's it's casted really well. It's funny. Um, in fact, they did so well with the Guardians initial movie that you start to see the script, dialogue, and plot and character development, you start to see all of that change in all of the other Marvel films over the next couple of years because of the success that Guardians had. You see, and I brought up Thor Ragnarok yeah, earlier. Yeah, ruined it's, Thor. Yeah. It, I, yeah, a lot of people love <laughs> Thor Ragnarok the most. I think it's my least favorite. I'm not going to lie. It's, it was my least favorite out, yes. of, out of the three. Um, but that's just me. Anyways, uh, that's MCU's a debate for another day. Um, but yeah, for me, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Gary, let's go to you. Your recommendation for this week. My recommendation for this week seeing as it's a space movie that we're trying to find, is Mom and Dad Save the World. That was a good one. Um, it's got uh, the uh, the wonderful John Lovitz, whom I would still love to have a cup of coffee We've with. We've been even asking him two. to get on here with us for like four months, yep. and we still haven't heard back. Maybe he'll listen to this one. I don't know. Probably but uh, it's <laughs> Over a fun, two hours? I don't it, know about that one, man. It, it's a fun uh, comedy movie uh, <laughs> and uh, quite enjoyable. So, yes, that's my recommendation. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, Neil. Uh, so my sci-fi recommendation this week is going to be 2014's Edge of Tomorrow. I think it was oh, yeah, a very 
Yeah. Unappreciated film, and I think it's a really good one and enjoyable. So that's live, die, re- live yeah. die, repeat, baby. Hell yeah. yeah. <laughs> I give that a 9.0 out of 10, by the way. It's a good I fucking I think movie, it's a really great movie. One of, a, one of the oh best. Oh, my God, that's a pretty time. good score coming from Gary. It, it is. is. One of the best time travel All movies. All you need is kill. Check <laughs> check out our uh, time travel episode episode from la- from season one, and uh, you'll you'll hear us We were so young back live then. Live, die, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> like three months ago <laughs> get the fuck out of here uh jacob uh when Arash recently was uh, sputnik it's a russian uh sci-fi movie uh, it's basically about a guy who comes back from a space mission and he's been infected with something and it's equal parts uh, alien and species and it's really intriguing uh, especially the way the creature manifests itself it's it's very surprising uh, and it's all about symbiosis it's better basically a better venom movie i would say but okay. I highly recommend it. Hard, not hard to beat the one that just came out. No. So sorry, Tom Hardy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Luke. Can't wait for Morbius. <laughs> you know that Spider-Man character, you guys? I can't wait for Jared. He was my favorite growing I up. I can't wait for Jared Leto to fuck up another. Well, I guess that was DC, but whatever. Uh, Luke, your recommendation for this week. Uh, this week, I'm going to go with something sort of akin to what Gary and the rest of us were talking about earlier. I'm going to go with Star Trek five the final frontier the uh, most panned okay. of the wonderful star trek theatrical releases um you know uh, you could go with wrath of khan you could go with four you could go with six which are all great but five is good because i think the message in five is great about confronting your pain and about how the tribulations that we face in life make us who we are and if we try to suppress those and if we try to run from those they just make us a dull copy a sort of submissive copy of, of ourselves so the the chemistry between the characters is good you get that good banter between spock and kirk and mccoy that you got in tos that was played up in star trek 4 well extrapolated on star trek 5 with the theme that's heady enough that it kind of works and if you can get past the uh the the ego indulgence that it is being a william shatner project there's still <laughs> there's still some good old-fashioned wholesome star trek fun in it for you sure. don't ask the almighty for his driver's license don't ask the almighty shut for his id shut up quit and drinking mccoy the idea that kirk could climb el cap <laughs> is absolutely hilarious he had again boots. shatner's indulgence i'll never deny <laughs> god uh spencer how about you uh, am I allowed to recommend a series instead sure. of a film? Yeah, it's fine. Uh, my recommendation for awesome sci-fi content uh, is going to be Cowboy Bebop. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. All right. my, yeah. uh, Outside the box. Uh, hands right. down my favorite anime ever. It's If you haven't seen it, it's Bounty Hunters in Space. Uh, probably also, for my money, the best music of any anime, uh, thanks to Yoko Kano and Seatbelts uh, for their absolutely insane soundtracks. Uh, it, it it ranges from early on in the series some, uh, you know, just badass uh, bounty hunter adventures, and then it starts getting real heavy real quick. Uh, so highly recommend uh, you sink some time into Cowboy Bebop. Uh, easy to stream. Uh, it's on uh, Hulu right now, I think. Perfect. All right. All right, guys, those are our recommendations for the week. Uh, we Once again, uh, Jacob, Luke, Spencer, thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, we will certainly try to have you guys back on for part two of this. Not sure when that'll be yet, but we'll, we'll see what out. happens. Yeah, we're, we're, we're moving on to Star Trek next, so uh, we'll, 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 let, oh, we'll let everybody know. <laughs> um, yeah, so make sure to check out um, Jacob Johnson's podcast, Jacob and Reese versus Evil, and uh, they are... Where are you guys streaming at nowadays? Are you guys on any of the... Are you just on your website? still or what we're just at? on our website currently we haven't done anything with spotify or itunes yet okay well google them and they'll 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 come up yeah it's on screenpunk.net but we basically cover horror movies okay all right check them out uh and once again i'm johnny i'm gary i'm neil and thanks for joining us we'll see you all next week Thank you for tuning in to Lead Feather Productions' podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Lead Feather production. Copyright Lead Feather Productions 2021.